bring the uh, sunset on race night on Saturday is uh, 21.38 Central European time and the sun comes back up officially at 05.23 in the morning. So what's that? Seven and a half, seven hours 35 or thereabouts of darkness. A very, very short amount of darkness at this time of the year. Unsurprisingly, already some debris on the exit of the pit lane, which everybody seems to be seeing and uh, avoiding on the way out. Not really sure what that is. Looks like, let's have a quick look down there. Looks like a piece of maybe some tubing maybe a brake cooling duct or something like that i have to say i didn't notice bruce any um coming together maybe we get an opportunity no ah, it's that's very odd so it was the 54 was it i think it came off the 309 that was just oh. running in front of it definitely the lexus ran over whatever it is the, yeah. On their website, the Mulman Motorsport Cayman was 309 and 54 by uh, flicking down the incredibly long list of 120 plus cars was the no Novel Racing Lexus, the RCF. That's yeah. the only one of the Lexuses in the race. But uh, funny little trip ups early on, but uh, I don't think any particular damage done. But again, John, in the interim, I was doing lots of research, just checking who was on which tyres. They do change from session to session. But unfortunately, I've made a bit of an error. A lot of the cars are carrying a Falcon logo above the front wheel arch. Yes. Doesn't mm. mean they're on Falcon tyres. No. So I'm having to go back through my notes as they're fitting tyres up and down the pit lane and go, right, Goodyear, those are Michelin. So yeah, I'll get it right for later. That is a um, Falcon are a, uh, an event sponsor. Remember, this is not part. This is great. This is absolutely great. This is one of the last great single events in the world. It's not part of a championship, the Total ADAC Nürburgring 24 hours, um, but they do have sponsors. And one of those is, is Falcon Tires. So they are on all the cars, regardless of whose tires they wear. It's also, we talked about this earlier on, Peter, it's one of the last bastions of, of tire competition in the top classes variety of the classes some of them have a sole tire supplier but in the top class um, that's not the case and and i think last year there was 12 or 13 different manufacturers represented across the the weekend and i think it's great to see this i know there'll be people who are shouting at the top of their voices about costs but this is a test track for all of the major manufacturers of tyres and cars. So it's absolutely, for me, appropriate that we should have a freedom for tyre choice. Well, I, th I completely agree with you. I think uh, if you th on the subject of cost, if you're the look at it from the tyre manufacturer's point of view, they put a lot of marketing dollars into motorsport, um, all of them do. And the thing is, what there isn't a more effective way to get the best drivers in the world and the best cars in the world to put your tyres through their paces. Although I think we're going to be talking a lot about those tyres throughout the weekend. Obviously, we've got changeable weather all weekend long. It's going to be wet. And I'll, I'll refer our listeners back to Petit Le Mans 2015 <laughs> when the Michelin tyres on the Porsche 911 RSR were pretty handy to that car winning overall past all of the prototypes. Past, past all of the prototypes on a number of occasions because every time there was a full course caution and the safety car came out, they reset the field with the, the prototypes ahead of the GT cars. So Patrick Peeler, Nick Tandy had to overtake them several times actually uh, in that. And uh, there's a great story behind that, that uh, Patrick Peeler asked the then head of, of Porsche GT Motorsport, uh, Frank Stefan Valliser, who's now head of mission for Porsche 911 in total. Uh, he said, listen, if we win, Petit Le Mans, can I buy the car from you? And, and Porsche are pretty careful about let, a bit like Ferrari, about letting the cars, the race cars go. And Frank said, no. And PP said, what about an overall win? And Frank said, yeah, if you win overall, I'll sell you the car. And before the start of the race, he went to Nick Tandy. PP went to Nick Tandy and said, right, 
we're in. We can, we can have this. You, you want to do it? Do you want to jump into this? And Nick was like, yeah, because we're going to win overall. <laughs> and at the end of the race, in fairness, Frank Stefan Valliser, who I, I know pretty well now, and who is a very honourable man, he sold Patrick Pele the car, and it is in Patrick Pele's collection. It's in his garage. And what, three or four years after that victory, it went to Rensport, having never run since the, it was turned off at the end of that race. And they changed the oil and warmed it up properly, spun it up properly, and ran it at Rensport. And it was a thing of beauty. And, and Pele loves telling that story. Tandy hates hearing that story because he wasn't in on the tail, which I, I think is very, very funny. Very, very funny indeed. Uh, 704 is the clicking house, the bright red car that is heading back into the pit lane after an exploratory lap of the Grand Prix circuit at the moment. We've still got that situation on the front straight where you have the opportunity to go around and do the lap of the Grand Prix circuit and then either cut back into the straight or go back onto the start finish lane and start straight and start a flying lap marked out by cones. And that will disappear when we come to race at the weekend. Jim Glickenhouse, very excited about the prospects this weekend of that 004C SCG Scuderia Cameron Glickenhouse machine. Just the one of them in the race. And already braving the conditions on the Nordschleifer and heading down to Callenhard, Martin Ranginger in the number 44 Falcon tyres. Uh, Motorsports Porsche 911 down through Callan Hard on and off the throttle, just balancing the car through the three right handers before going down hard through the gearbox before the fourth and into the hairpin, dropping down here. Got his teammate right in front of him actually at the moment as they head towards the bridge at Adana, passing one of the Cayman GT4s. Normally, you'd be breaking up the, as the road comes in at the right-hand side. Used to be a nice visual clue as you go across the bridge. There was a change in the tarmac as you rose up the other side, which is where you lifted off and turned in, but it's all been resurfaced now. So that's disappeared. The louder links, the louder left here, where Nicky had his terrible accident that effectively ended Formula One racing at this circuit. And now through the long, and you be so patient through the long, right-hander as you start to climb the hill. Three left-handers now where it gets progressively tighter. The dirt on the road for Ragginger. He's climbing up through there. Even in a road car, last time I took the 993 through, through there, 135 miles an hour on a, in a road car on road tyres. These guys going significantly quicker as they climb the hill. And it's all about feeling the grip at this point. You stay away from the curbs as you are going up towards the next major landmark, which is the base of the hill before the Caracciola, Caracciola Carousel, which is where Ragginger is now. He goes down through the box and turns in right-handed. Now climbing the hill again. And immediately you've got to be looking so far ahead of you. End of the advertising hoarding is about where you aim as you drop in. It happens to be AMG this year. Rattle your teeth out on the concrete of the carousel. Pop out like a cork from a bottle and then head into the middle part of the lap where so many corners look the same. And that is the skill of knowing this lap, Bruce Jones, where you can push, where it's a fourth gear flat out right hander and where it's a second gear break hard left hand uh, right hander because you can't afford to make mistakes at that part of the circuit out in the country it's a piece of cake just a mere 170 turns around the course of the lap but of course what they're getting now over the next half hour is fading light falling light. they all look that little bit different but anybody on this outlap uh, and now starting to wind it up on the first fly will appreciate the track is uniformly dry or certainly every millimeter I've seen so far. Got a little bit of shading from the you talk, John, just about a little flurry of rain 
in the intervening period, but it is to all extents and purposes a clear track. Well, not a clear track just there for Martin Raginger because the GT4 Mercedes in his path has uh, slowed him and allowed Lance David Arnold in the 33, the sister car to the 44 Falcon Motorsport Porsche, to pull that little bit clear. But uh, it's the, the track is, I think, as good as it can be. A bit more rubber going down would be welcome. But uh, right now, you get to ride on board with the experts. So many drivers yes. do so many races on the Nürburgring. And uh, you can understand that every single one adds useful experience. There is something, Peter, and, and I know you haven't been around the Nordschleife, but there is something quite magical about a circuit that is so wonderfully based in the past as the Nürburgring Nordschleife. I mean, we hear in F1 circles people talking about Monaco. Monaco would never be a Monaco as an F1 circuit now. It just, people would laugh at you and turn away. The Nürburgring Nordschleife, you look at it now and think, Oh my God, how did they race Group C cars around there? How did they race Formula One cars around there? And yet with the GT3 cars that we're seeing here at the moment, they are spending less than six and a half minutes, fewer than six and a half minutes on the Nordschleife itself, um, which just goes to underline the development in street-based racing cars, and particularly, we were talking about this early on, particularly, Peter, the tyres, because they they allow such mag magnificent performance houses. I, I think, yeah, it's a combination of all of those things, but there's a strong arg argument to say that the tyre technology has probably advanced the most in terms of the pure lap time. I mean, to give a bit of context for the Nordschleife, the last time the Nürburgring 1,000 kilometres was held on the Nordschleife, before moving to the Grand Prix circuit was when Stefan Beloff, Stefan Beloff obliterated the lap record on the 28th of May 1983 a 6 minute and 11 second lap in 1983 nearly 40 years ago I mean you have to let that one sink in and we mentioned in qualifying this morning Timo Bernhard's record of 5 minutes 19 in the 919 Evo and Timo said yeah but did, did the lap he said I would never do that in a million years in the Group C car no way. <laughs> uh, and I said to him I said you know what you've done Timo is you've given people of my generation you've given them an appreciation of what Stefan Beloff actually did that day which right. deserves its place in motor racing folklore I believe but, but doesn't it also that was in qualifying so of course it, it's not yeah. a race lap record um, but, but I mean, if you look at just the times that is extraordinary but doesn't that tell you, Peter, how good, you know, people will look at these GT3 cars, they'll hear us talk about these GT3 cars, and in some ways, they will dismiss them because they're only GT3 cars. I still have, to me, somewhat bizarre conversations with people who don't watch IMSA because there's no LMP1 cars in it. And yet, huh. the, the current set of DPIs are doing the same sort of times as the full fat 1200 horsepower P1 Peugeots and Audi's diesels were doing. And these GT3 cars doing a 625, 623 or, or whatever they are around the Nordschleife. Now I accept that the Nordschleife has changed a little bit. It's a lot smoother um, than when Stefan Belloff did it. Well, he was doing that in what was then effectively an LMP1 car, Group C car. These are, group, th these are GT3 cars. Nobody can tell me these guys aren't hanging it out and aren't giving it everything. You've only, you've only got to watch any of the onboard footage that you can find on, on YouTube or anywhere else from these guys. These guys are racing as hard now as they've ever raced before on the Nürburgring Nord Nordschleife, aren't they? Oh, for, for sure. I mean, if you look at an onboard of Kevin Estra in a, a GT3 RS road car, let alone the race yes. car. And it, 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 <laughs> or Lars Kern, his teammate. Hat absolutely. Off. Oh, my words. I mean, i tell you what, here's a question for you, John. Of course, we've got a new, there are some Porsche Cup cars in the field in the SP7 class, but they're the 991 generation. This new 992 Correct. Cup car looks like a proper spaceship. I tell you what, when Manta get their hands on those oh. things, 
they're going to be ruffling some SP9 feathers when they get when they finally in, or inevitably come to, to play here at the Nürburgring. It's it's a good point that you make there, Peter, because the the new 992 Cup car in common with the 992 uh, road going GT3 double wishbone front suspension, wider track, different diameter wheels front and rear on the road car. Although in fairness, on the Cup car they're still using the 18-inch rims with the, the Michelin uh, N-Series Pilot Sport uh, tyres. But those cars, at the test at Sebring, when they were having their debut in America, they were lapping at around the same speed, or perhaps, a, dare I say it, a little bit quicker than the GT Daytonas, which are current GT3 cars. And that was with guys having been told, uh, by the way, guys, you're testing before the first round of the new for 2021 Carrera Cup North America. And if you crash, we have no more shells. We have no new shells in in uh, North America at the, at the moment. So you're going to have to be a bit sensible. And they were still lapping at GT3 speeds. What is the GT3? The full house GT3 992 going to be like. Uh, we've got an incident out on the circuit uh, just beyond the Nicky Lauder left heading up to uh, Bergwerk and that is one of the Porsche Cayman GT4s on that uh, that's the blue and white car I feel I should know that car Bruce You'll I think it might be the Schmickler Motorsport car yeah, I do, I could rely on you well no don't rely on me, don't bet your house on it otherwise the house goes away but uh, again there are so many Caymans in so many classes, John. I just want to get it right before I announce uh, who has gone off uh, on the ex Vex Muller. Yeah, um, I have several different uh, entry lists here, and um, I'm flicking through the one that has photographs on to try and help me. It's a very distinctive colour scheme. I, I think you might be might be might it have been 301 the APS Rensport car it, it could be some of them when you click on them there appears to be no photograph but when you click on the, the grey box oh so will reveal itself as I discovered literally Ooh. three minutes ago Ooh. right okay that, that's that's a whole evening of excitement for Peter and I too. it's like opening an advent calendar in the run up to Christmas <laughs> <laughs> my advent calendar last year and thank you to the responsible adult for this was a Porsche 911 um, two litre ST, which you built out of bits from the, the advent calendar, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, coming up to 10 to 9 uh, in the Nürburgring, uh, the light beginning to fade, headlights being able to be picked out a wee bit more, so we will go into darkness in this session, uh, and that is hugely important to get yourself orientated on a racetrack which is difficult enough in daylight never mind anything else that Porsche is still parked it's 301 parked across the track the EPS Red Sport car it is so it a pale blue is it? tail oh. I think so again it's a high shot uh, one of the beauties of the, the Nordschleifer is it has so many corners one of the problems of the Nordschleifer is having cameras and therefore we rely for some of the greatest shots of all on a helicopter that uh, chased them around the circuit and it, it flew past, but the car was small beneath. Meanwhile, at other points on the circuit, the likes of David Pittard still pressing on, a British driver who's really made the Nürburgring Nordschleife his home. He's driving one of the three open horse motorsport SP9 class M6s, and he's got past the scene of the incident and now just uh, doing what he needs to do, just getting as much speed out of the car, getting the tyres to work as they should around the final quarter of the lap and uh, going very well indeed not quite at the very sharp end of the field but uh, in fact fourth place sorry last time Randy moved up to fourth place overall so he's within one and a half seconds of the ultimate pace still in the hands of the number six Mercedes of Nico Bastia at the end of that first session well a bit like the uh, the judges on um, the voice I think we have got three of us in uh, you know unanimity at the moment because I think Peter and I agree with Bruce there, Peter, you, you're happy with that? It's 3-1 came into the Cup League class. 
Well, this is uh, this is uh, is the um, shall we call it the virtual advent calendar of Nurburgring cars. I love it. Uh, it changes. <laughs> you click on the car, and it actually changes its uh, its stripes. So it's got its race. Uh, its race livery is different to the whenever it got its photograph taken, and there is a few cars like that. Guys, I I'll have you. Open advent calendar picture for 304. I think it'd be one of the K Kramer racing oh, cars. It's all white on it. In fact, I'll bet your house on it, John. 304, which is driven by uh, Ashin Fatermi, Henning Kramer, Jean Francois Bruno, and Yevgen Sokolovsky. And whoever's driving it isn't driving it because it's still nose in. Uh, across the circuit. Hello to Dan Wells. Dan, great to know that uh, you are tuned in and uh, celebrated a birthday last week, uh, sitting on the sofa with a chilled beverage, uh, watching the coverage. Is there any better way to go? And by the way, if you're in the UK, um, search out down by Salisbury, uh, just off one of the big main roads down there the haven it's dan dan's family's uh, restaurant which is has a fabulous reputation i was going to try and book down there this week but the clamp down in france didn't stop me going down there but it meant that we had to reorganize the elms coverage this weekend but dan i promise i'll, I'll pop down and see your dad and your sister uh, in the next few days in fact we almost met bruce down there um, for a bit of a, a, a meet-up, which uh, then, as I say, couldn't happen because of a couple of things. Um, hard work is great food and always a bit of a motorsport chat down there. So if you... Um, it's off the year 30, if memory serves. Dan will send me a, a note if I've got that horribly wrong. But look it up. It's, uh, the, the menu is sumptuous and uh, worth popping down there somewhere near Thruxton of course always worth popping in round there as well. Mirka bought a lotty out at the moment in the Hankook sponsored Lamborghini Huracan Hankook uh, one of the Thai companies along with one of the car companies who over in Gottlieb Daimlerstrasse which is barely a quarter of a mile from the Dottiger Hall and runs parallel to it have their technical centre and the testing that goes on around the Nordschleife on what are called the industry days is legendary. Plenty of photographers out there looking at new cars going round there, disguised cars going out round there. And even, in fact, sometimes on the tourist laps, the tourist far. And last time I was there, I think I was... Uh, passed by a new version of the Mercedes, the MG GT3, as it headed on to the Nordschleife. I was in an Alfa Giulia uh, Quadrifoglio diesel, so I wasn't going to give him a hard time, in fairness. But um, when you see John, something that you've never seen before, yes. I was driving a Toyota RAV4, eat your hearts out, ladies and gentlemen, but it was in Namibia, that's very cool, and we were racing to get to the airport to fly home, and then suddenly I would suggest four, perhaps six cars that I'd never seen before came bang, 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 past me the other way. Couldn't get a camera out. It was some while later before I finally saw some spy shots of the original Audi TT. Ah. That could have been a ching, ching moment, but alas for Jones, it wasn't. But uh, it's safe to say I think you're fairly far from prying eyes if you're charging up and down in Namibia. You'd hope so. You would, wouldn't you? Yeah. Good roads too. <laughs> you uh, really would. Uh, the, the Haven Salisbury is at Thursdown, uh, www.thehaven-salisbury.com. And I was right, it, it is just off the, the A30, the London Road. Tell them we sent you. Um, always guaranteed a good welcome, fabulous food, and if required, a bit of motorsport chat. I'm going to try and do a bit of a meet-up there later in the year. In the pit lane, uh, plenty of action going on, and quite clearly things getting darker the GTEC competition Porsche came in GT4 Club Sport 718 that's the uh, Patrick Grutte Fabio Grosser Max Cronenberg and Ben Bunigal driven car black and red surely one of the biggest successes of Porsche's road and race cars in 
recent years, the mid-engine, Porsche going back to the mid-engine. I still don't understand why people haven't taken to the mid-engine Porsches. The, the Boxster, when the 986 came out, pretty much saved the firm. Used a lot of the same components as the then 996, 911. That's why it was so important. And then the development of the Boxster and subsequently the hardtop Cayman through the various iterations and just for those of, the, of you who perhaps haven't heard me say this before the type numbers so 986 981 718 but all of those you always refer to those as, as in those terms whereas the model number so 917, 911, 968. That is Porsche speak. I've been pulled up that on that by Porsche in in the past, and there's a the distinctive difference between the type number and the model number. Those mid-engine Porsches are such a lovely thing to drive and can handle loads more power than ever the road cars have. Although in fairness, they're, they've gone back to a six-cylinder. Um, there is a four litre now GTS version and a GT4 version of the uh, what is now the 718 versions of those cars and with a bit of luck and a fair wind you should be able to bring your real world road test on the 718 Cayman soon now, one of the things that always strikes and is very much part of the Nürburgring 24 hours, of course, is the diversity, the huge number of classes. And when looking at the top class, SP9, John, they're driven as smoothly as possible, don't have the ultimate power. You were talking earlier, comparing them to, you know, prototypes from the past and how the drivers are absolutely flat out everywhere. But the cars that look most as though they're being driven flat out, so of course, the TCR category cars. We only have six of them in the race, which is a bit of a shame because they're just so dynamic, skittering around the circuit. And uh, the Hyundai 130N, what a driver lineup they've got there. Luca Engstler, Hendrik Still, who's at the wheel at the moment of 831, and Jean Carn Verde. And of course, there's WTR, TCR championship action here, as well as the 24 hours this weekend. So, quite a few of the top TCR drivers, two timing, but they but from curb to curb, and they're yes. very, very skitterish through the corners, and they must be absolutely exhausting to drive in a 24-hour race, but uh, they certainly make me smile. Yeah, the WTCR race this weekend is over just what, a couple of three laps, but it does have the competition debut of the new RS3 Audi, and the new version of that car, which Chris Renke and the rest of Audi Sport customer racing are very excited about. And we're seeing that before we've seen the road going version of that car, which is uh, extraordinary. But sort of right here at the Nürburgring, as we were discussing in the earlier programmes. Sorry, Peter, what were you going to say there before uh, before Bruce uh, and I were chatting about whatever it was we were chatting? Well, I was, I, was, I was also going to break the golden rule of no talking about model numbers before dark, but... Uh, <laughs> No, no, that's fine here. Yes, uh, I think it's brilliant that Porsche brought back the, the 718 name because those cars were, you know, when Porsche was barely 15 years old, and they're bringing out these, well, of course, they're barely five years old when they brought out the 550 Spider, which was the mid-engine one, and then yes. that very quickly morphed into the 718, which, of course, had uh, a four-cylinder um, boxer engine. So there is a lot of historical, uh, historical links, and, of course, those cars did incredibly well, did a heck of a lot of giant killing oh. right here at the Nürburgring. And would you not take a, a 914 any day, a 914 yeah, any day of the week? Yeah, 914, six. An orange Brumos 59. Oh. Yeah, yeah. A, nine, <laughs> a, nine, a 914, six, yes, but even a four-cylinder. So mm -hmm. look, when you look at what Porsche do, particularly with their sports cars, there's history written all over it. And when people criticise the Cayman and the Boxster for not being quote unquote proper Porsches. I'm afraid I'm afraid I just have to say to them, Pa, you are wrong. You're absolutely wrong. And and anyone who's driven one of those more modern 
mid-engine Porsches would absolutely understand why, pound for pound, euro, euro for euro, dollar for dollar, the performance levels that you get out of those cars are absolutely superb. To, and, and listen, I've spoken to plenty of people in Porsche Club, Club GB and Porsche Club America who will tell you they are better value than the 911. Dare I say that? I, it, it's, it's not an uncommon chat that people have. Why, why would you bother with a 911 when you can have a, a Cayman with a four litre flat six nowadays for 30 grand cheaper? It's an interesting chat. And you might get one. Well, well, that's the, that is the other point. That is absolutely right. You've got half a chance of, of possibly getting one. Uh, more debris on the circuit. This, in fact, this is a Cayman right-hand headlight that has come adrift down at the bottom of the Grand Prix circuit, which has been nicely moved off the track by a couple of BMWs. Oh, that was fairly thoughtful of them, Bruce, there. Yeah, very kind. I mean, you know, they can charge the others for saving them a puncture, but... Uh... <laughs> The pale blue and white uh, Cayman we saw, we still think it's the GTEC competition number 305, sorry, um, 304, K Kramer racing example. Uh, that's been pulled off through a gap in the barriers. That's not troubling anyone, but obviously upsetting the team because this three hour session has turned to be about tw 10 minutes for them before it was curtailed. Very little damage in the first qualifying session. This second qualifying session, I noticed the 105 Racework Motorsports. 325i BMW in the SP4 class and uh, something had clattered into the back of it so that's limping home with its rear bumper hanging down at a oh, jaunty if you wish sort of angle but uh, generally very clean at the moment and I think everybody reveling John in the fact the track is dry for now and uniform. The I, I, I think we need to go back to our original thought which was the EPS Red Sport 301 GmbH uh, oh, really? machine yeah I've been checking the the tracker and the ticker and i do think it's a three or one that's pulled off to to the side um it, it's very tough to tell but um i think that car is off just beyond bergberg which is or at bergberg for bergberg which is where we identified that issue i'm talking about times gentlemen uh top of the times at the moment Patrick Assenheimer for Team HRT AMG Mercedes of course at 8.23 roughly speaking Mr Jones what we saw this morning uh, I think it's actually the same time the session seems to be combined if it's oh, 8.23.596 yes, no, you're absolutely right yes so absolutely the times stay right. as they were but that was Nico Bastian uh, but what we do have now is uh, one of the Frickadelli Porsches right on the tail, just over a quarter of a second in arrears, and Fred Makaviki at the wheel of that at the moment. So now we've got uh, two seconds flat covering the top five. Mercedes, Porsche, Audi, BMW. Uh, then for good measure, the fifth one, another Audi. But it's the number six HRT Mercedes, Patrick Assenheimer at the wheel. He's top of the charts, or that car is at the moment. Fred Makaviki second for Frickadelli Racing at Audi Sports Team Car Collection. And who's done it, been there on the t-shirt etc Christopher Hassa third fastest uh, talking earlier on this week about the Toyota Corolla Altis which originally was entered with uh, Sutipong Spitarach and Natavuda Charan Sukita Wanata who's known as um, Mad Cow back in, in Thailand Manat uh, Kula Planont and Natapong Porticum. I'm not sure that those are the drivers who are taking part in that, but that is the Toyota Kazoo Racing Team Thailand. I've worked with Natavuda, Karen Sakuna, Watana before in the Race of Champions out in the Ramangajala Stadium uh, out there. And the man is an absolute megastar in his home country. More for his rallying exploits, uh, but he is very, very good at anything he does. And in fairness, Toyota Kazoo Racing Team Thailand have bought a variety of Toyotas here down through the years. And that Corolla Altis, which is sort of a, it's a crossover as such, but it's a, do you remember the, the Golf Plus and the Golf Match? Um, or the um, original, um, what was the extra high Fiesta called? I can't remember, but it's the same sort of, 
into the confusion. Well done. Oh, yes, well done, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Um, it's the same sort of of uh, of concept as that. Excellent anorak <laughs> behaviour by my two co cops there. Um, and yet they have done very well. They're in the SP3 category with a um, couple of uh, other cars in that. I think we, we decided there was four cars in that category over the weekend, including is the class, I think, um, that has the Dacia Logan, or is that just SP3 and yeah. the other one's SP3T, isn't it? So it has the turbo uh, on it. Dolly mixture class. It is the Dolly mixture class. You're absolutely right. But oh, you're going to fit in so well here, Lisa. You really are. The, you've never seen a class with a Dacia Logan, a Toyota Corolla Altis, a Toyota GT86, and a 1980s Opel Manta in one class. Uh, have you, did you see the, the GTE Mark One electric version that Opel have yes. pushed out? How lovely does that look? I mean, all right, whether it ever makes production is not the point, but Resto Mod on an E style E is actually a really interesting concept, isn't it? Well, R Renault have done the same. They've done it. They've released a concept of. Uh, a uh, Renault 5 um, yep. electric and I think it, it's well just look at how the look at the attention I know it's not electric but look at the attention the Alpine A110 oh. got when it came out and still continues to get and uh, it's a it's a I think it's a really tasteful homage to the uh, to the original I think they should really be bold and go for the Renault 4 frankly ah, get those well, seats out for your picnic wait wait the Renault 4 is about to be reborn as an all-electric car, Bruce. So you are spot on. The uh, Stellantis group, which is um, about half the car manufacturers in the world, it would seem, at the moment. Um, and I was reading this in Auto Express, uh, which is still the best weekly buy that you can have for, for anything if you're automotive-minded. Um, the Renault 4 is coming back as an all-electric uh, platform. So there you go. And it is you know, going to take some of the styling cues from the original car. Well, I think that'd be great because as a child, if I was lucky enough to go camping in France, what I loved was the fact that the cars were so unutterably French. You know, the Renault 4s, the Peugeot 304s, the Panhards, which are my absolute favourites because I've seen nothing like those in my sort of home counties upbringing and then, then living overseas. And I love the fact that German cars were German and Italian cars were Italian, but French, they were just, they couldn't be anything else. And I, I do sort of rather miss the fact that the styling has become sort of less less dissimilar, let's say. And I, I thought French cars at the time just were, were magnificent. Well, and, and you know, there's a, a family story, which I'm, I'm pretty certain is apocryphal that my first words were Vauxhall and Viva and that, you know, even when I was a wee toddler, I could spot the cars. I, I struggle to spot different cars now because they are sort of generic. Um, and race cars, and particularly at the sharp end of things in, in Formula One, Bruce, and you and I talked about this with Andre Marriott at the, our coverage of the Monaco Historique. If you painted all the current F1 cars, black well in fact if you just left them carbon would you be able to tell them apart you could back in the day now it'd be rather more difficult wouldn't it yeah i know it, it is a big loss you can see why it's happened and how it's happened of course aerodynamic tweaks now less easy to come by you've got they take a uniform approach and uh, what works for one and then they get very upset if suddenly you know i say is that rear wing flexing etc <laughs> etc we keep moving Certainly some, some of the rear wings around here are flexing a bit, but that's because they're hitting the kerbs as they're trying to make the oh. shortest line around the lap. It's supposed to be 25.378 kilometres, and I think some of the very best pros here are making it just that tad shorter. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Peter, you're a, you're a, a bit, uh, have a little less life experience than than Bruce Bruce and I. So, so, so what... I, I, <laughs> to see what I did there, Bruce, really. You know, yes, come on. definitely, I think. Um, the, what then... What are the cars of your childhood that you look at now and think of as, as classics? Because it tends to be, doesn't it, the cars that first, 
that first attract your attention as uh, a relatively young person? Well, for me, my it, it all started for me in 1995 when Colin, Colin McRae won the World Rally Championship. And for a, a young Scotsman to win the World Rally Championship in a Subaru Impreza, which up to that point was really a farmer's runaround, yep. let's be honest. And it became a boy racer's um, dream overnight. And it was the, the hills in Scotland where I lived were just echoing with the sound of flat four Impreza's for the next 15 years. So, you know, things like a 22B Impreza, yes, please. Um, but also, I've got the, you know, also coming from the Gran Turismo generation. So, like, yes. you know, Japanese stuff again. Japanese stuff. Uh, R34 Skyline. R34 but, Skyline. You talk of my language there, young yeah. man. But it's it's very hard to look past a McLaren F1 GTR. Those cars, oh, and the cars of their era as well. They're hard to look past those. But the, there's a real-world example and a very much not real-world example. Uh, did you see recently that uh, Mitsubishi UK, which sadly is sort of being wound up at the moment, is Mitsubishi drawing their horns given the 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 current circumstances, sold off their heritage collection, and same sort of areas you're talking about the Subarus. Of course, you had the the Evos. Uh, and there were some phenomenal cars coming up for auction that went for big, big money. Didn't the Tommy Mackinnon go for over a hundred grand? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and do you know what? I still thought that was worth. I saw Marino Franchitti, um, who is the previous um, owner of my 993. I just, we, we never say we owned it. We just keep it for the next generations. So I've got no clue I'm, 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 I'm handing it on to. Um, but he said, if I had the money, I would have bought for that. And, and I kind of wish I'd said to him, we should chip in and buy that because it was so original. It was perfect. You two have drank the Kool-Aid. You really have. Yeah. A <laughs> hundred grand for it. I mean, <laughs> I, I would, GT, I, I, I could, you could buy a GT3 for that money. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fair. Well, if. No, you can't though. That's the problem because people are selling them for three hundred twenty-five grand. <laughs> There's your issue. Uh, hello to Kevin McLean, who's listening in. Uh, really Irish, Kevin, as as we know him. Uh, it's been a while since uh, we've had the opportunity to sit and uh, have a a wee dram with him and talk about cars. Kevin, I hope you're well. Good to know that you're tuned in and qualifying too across the RSL. Network with uh, Peter Mackay, Bruce Jones and John Heindorf in the Global Broadcast Centre and still with over two hours and 17 minutes to go of this session. The evening drawing in, as as my, my uh, grandma might say, the nights are drawing in, uh, she would say. Martin ragging it down the dotting a hole at the moment. Oh, three wide for a moment, three across the track just coming past where you would normally pull off on the tourist far and big set of big uh, flashing of lights side by side with the drone racing uh, Porsche as well and that's now is that that's a GT uh, GT3 AM entered car but still very very quick indeed that's about the drivers rather no actually that's not Bruce is it the the drone car sorry Peter that's a um that's a, a, a 911 Cup class car, isn't it? That was quick in a straight line. It certainly was, but we do see that sort of over the years, the ability in a straight line, of course, around the course of the whole lap, they will lose out. Can I just throw one little Mitsubishi moment in? We were just oh, talking about that a short while ago. Drove past about two or three weeks ago, drove past Mitsubishi's old British headquarters in Sirencester, and the car I would have wanted to pick out of their collection was the... Dangan ZZ, just under 600 cc oh. turbocharged engine, small enough I to drive can't. down a footpath. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Sounded fantastic with a tiny little water-cooled engine. And I remember a friend of mine who intended to drive uh, 911 saying, I'm, "I'm not going to be seen in that." I said, "Take the seat." He couldn't stop laughing. It was the ultimate city car. Oh. Not the world's greatest looker, but uh, if ever you get a chance to look at a, a Dangan ZZ. Do take a look at it quite seriously because uh, in terms of smiles per mile that was a, an absolute cracker of a car back in the early 90s that was they all came out bruce didn't they of the 
the Japanese regulations, the K cars, um, effectively, that, that were all tiny wee. Um, there was sports car versions of them. There was little almost crossover versions of them. They tried to make limos uh, out of them. Um, I, I remember Suzuki did a, a little two-door sports car that looked like a, a, a Dodge Viper that was shrunk in the the wash. There was the Daihatsu. That was the Cappuccino. The Cappuccino, yes, that's right. And then there was the, the Daihatsu Copen, three cylinders. Fabulous the amount of engineering in those cars, though. No, exactly. They were very clever little things, but they were all immense fun. I, I think it's the Honda Beat, the Suzuki Cappuccino, it's the Titchy Dangers. Anyhow, we'll put a few hooks out there and see what we managed to draw in. Yes, uh, obviously no under 1600cc uh, cars in, in this event for quite some time. I kind of understand why, but I do miss some of the uh, little Daihatsus that, that ran around here various privateer teams when we had 200 plus cars limited to 170 just under 130 this weekend at a quarter past nine in the evening here in the eiffel the 704 bright red and white that is the glicken house running at the moment out in the gathering gloom as we uh, mentioned and that, at the moment, has who behind the wheel? It was Westy. Thomas... Sorry, say again, Peter. I think it's Westy at the wheel of Is the SCG, SCG 004. Uh, Glickenhaus. Could you, could you call him a Glickenhaus factory driver? With yes, status, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yes, because uh, he's, he's part of the uh, Le Mans hypercar programme with Franck Mayer, who is uh, another one of the drivers in that 004C this weekend. I tell you what, don't we need more Jim Glickenhauses in this world? What, what about his P45 that he built on the, what was then the 360 platform and raced here? Oh my goodness, fantastic. Uh, th there is something about that Glicken house. Uh, I accept that, you know, it, it it has to draw on on various cars uh, and influences, Peter. There's, there's a, certainly a look of Honda NSX at the back of that car. You can see there's a bit of Ferrari in that as well. But there's something that I think works about that car. It looks really, it, it does look like a, a proper thing. And, and it, I think they've done really well to develop their own identity. I really do. I, I, I totally agree. And I, I really sincerely hope that they're able to, I mean, obviously they're, they're going to be exclusive cars. I really hope they can produce the amount of cars that they want to make for road use. Because I know that's a big part of Jim Glickenhouse's ethos that whatever you drive, you can race it and you can drive it on the street. And uh, uh, I, I love that because the you know it's so rare now that you could have a car that you could drive on the street, take it onto the circuit, compete with it, and drive away. I mean, for example, you know, you look, you, <laughs> I was reading Jackie Stewart's book a couple of years ago, and he used to pick a Jaguar E-Type demonstrator off the family forecourt and go and win races with it. Yeah, oh, <laughs> magnificent. <laughs> you know, though, God of those days, but that. In some ways, Bruce, don't we all yearn for that in some respects? And isn't that even what... Right, first of all, this event, you look at some of the cars, particularly in the Nürburgring Lenk Strecker Series and, and also here, and frankly, you know, talking to Peter Kate last year, uh, winning his class in a, in a Cayman, which other than the race livery was pretty much standard. ACO want cars at the front of their field at Le Mans that look more like road cars than spaceships. Listen, I love the technology. Um, I'm not going to get into that argument now. But that there is a part of me that says that that isn't a bad idea, to be honest. No, and I, I, I actually think there is space for all of that. And anybody who's just for the first time looking at the Nerf Green 24 hours, you know it's the 49th running, what kept you, uh, or the NLS races, the diversity, you've got the special classes of the 30 potential classes or whatever, then you've got the production classes. And yet some of those cars look remarkably similar, but a small number of tweaks does put them in the different classes. And I, I really like the fact that um, you could pull something out of pretty much out of your garage and bring it here and race in a production class. And then who knows if you fancy a bit more speed, 
can find a bit more money, you move up. I'm all for anything that encourages people into the sport. Some are lucky enough to do it as teenagers. Some have to wait until they've earned the money themselves. It might mean they're the wrong side of 40, 50 or even 60, but they can still come and race on this, the ultimate race circuit in the world. And for the fans, we have some this year, but not as many, of course, as we've had over the decades, lining almost every centimetre of the circuit through the forest. But they will have their favourite cars. They will have a road car version. And so if there's a production class, it has a special resonance for them. Alongside, it's like supporting two football teams, John. You might have your team and then one that you've always got a soft spot for, possibly in another division. Yes. But, you know, you look to the, road, the, the, the production version of your car that's out there in the race and give it a little cheer every time it picks up a position. Yeah, that is a very good point. I like the... Um... I like that analogy. Um, I, I really do. Hello to Ingo Bata, who is uh, listening in at the moment in Europe rather than being based in uh, Asia at the moment. The man behind Absolute Racing. And he over here uh, until in Europe until uh, Le Mans, uh, I believe. Oh, the Altis has come to a grinding halt and we've got a code 60 purple board out at the moment one of the dmsb cars out there the recovery vehicles to try and pull that away not as the mercedes this year it used to be old two-door uh, jeep cherokees the original jeep cherokees a couple of those when i was in middle east in the gulf war uh, and that altus is not moving at the moment so there is a a wee bit of problem. Ingo, um, good to hear you listening. And uh, best of luck. Been good, actually, good start to the season for Absolute and the cars that they run in the Porsche Carrera Cup Asia Championship with a couple of uh, victories so far in the various classes. Although all sport I see has been curtailed in China uh, for at least a, a month and a half or so. So that's going to mean more issues with calendars towards the end of the year. But Ingo will find his way to a racetrack in Europe to enjoy himself, I'm sure. So we are down to just over two hours to go. I'm told by the boss that uh, our niece, Jessica Barry, who's the, uh, I believe, the youngest curator of a major art uh, uh gallery in the UK at Aberdeen uh, is putting her name on the 993. Um, interesting. I'll have to have a word with her about that. Uh, Felix Fontelaine is uh, struggling for Tycoon Racing. Just come over the bridge at Adena. Uh, not quite got up to the left hand at the Louder Links and that car is without power and he's trying to restart it so that's going to be a problem as the 911 Number 911 Porsche from Mantai is back in the pit lane, sitting in third position at the moment with a time from earlier on. What I'd kind of like to know is who has improved this evening. Well, I can tell you that Rene Rast has for Audi Sport Team Land in the number 29 Audi RA LMS. 8.24.996 is their best time of today and Bruce was entirely correct the very clever timing system at the Nürburgring Nordschleife and I'd forgotten this because I'd, I didn't cover this race this way last year I was on site doing Audi TV uh, whilst the RSL team covered it uh, covered the whole race um, they do manage Bruce to effectively give us the situation as it stands right now so the the number six car is the time that, that that car put in in the earlier session. Yeah, exactly so. But really the story, I suppose, we just looked at the Manti Racing 911, number 911, and that has just improved into that third place. The, it's not the fastest Porsche. That's the 31 Porsche, one of the two from Fricadelli Racing. But what we've generally seen is a tightening up of the top uh, about eight drivers. In fact, two minutes almost flat covers the top nine down to Josh Burden's KCMG Porsche. So it is closing, closing, closing. And don't forget, at the start of the first qualifying session early this day, just before the cars went out, how typical, you cried, the rain came down 
uh, particularly at the far side of the circuit. And we had drivers going around and going a dozen seconds faster than the best of the rest. And then they in turn were toppled by a similar margin, just emphasizing how wet it is. But now we've got a uniformly dry track and that's why the times are closing right up. But still that's number six HRT Mercedes sitting pretty at the top, but the margin is just, uh, just over a quarter of a second. So one good lap from someone else and we could have a different name at the top, but we've still got loads of time left, just over two hours in this three hour evening into night session at the Nürburgring. So do expect some faster times early on. And they are, John, as we talked earlier, largely just doing those longer runs, yes. getting every one of the four drivers through their, through their roster. I thought it was interesting talking to Klaus Backler, Bruce, uh, earlier on. Um, he has to do a couple of laps in each of the cars. Any driver who's who's entered in more than one vehicle has to do at least two flying laps in, in each of the cars during one of the qualifying sessions. Now, there are four, well, three qualifying sessions plus the, the top 30 shootout but that takes a bit of logistics management as well make sure that you don't forget if you're in the other car to get it amazing isn't it i've mentioned the 993 and share adam said surely I, I i i could have the 993 find out how your friends are uh don't you uh, let's uh, go through a couple of tweets at the moment uh alan prosser hello alan king of the screen grab alan during the race he'll be enhancing yeah, brilliant. Lanzarote Cam Camel on Twitter. Uh, Twitter at, uh, at RSL underscore studio. Hashtag RSL N24. Nissan almost also made a twin charged Micra called the March Turbo. Uh, supercharged, then the turbo took, took over at the height. I remember that car. That was another little rally car, the March Turbo. There was a few like that. Wicker Bill. Uh, I remember seeing the Suzuki Cappuccino for the first time. Um, we're visiting Great Eccleston to watch the tractor pulling. And what about the Skoda Felicia pickup as well? So 1990s in that bright yellow beer watch colour. Oh, yes, absolutely right. Hello to Laura Platman, Leica ambassador, photographer and journalist extraordinaire. She's tuned in <laughs> this evening. Uh, and suffice to say, uh, she's having some domestic issues. She's running another bath this, bath this time with hot water. Laura, nice to know you. You're tuned in. We've all been there. Uh, Stephen Lloyd says, look at the coverage. N24, fading light. Can't beat it. Duncan Vincent uh, has got the Aberfeldy 12 year old out. Oh, my goodness. Uh, from the distillery at the bottom of the road of the mains of Murthley Farm, right at the River Tier outside Aberfeldy. I remember that from my childhood. Oh, that's going to get that's going to get very, very messy later on if I crack open a bottle of the the Aberfeldy as well. Hello, Duncan. Nice to know that you're tuned in. Uh, Stathis Cotto at uh, RSL underscore studio. RSL N24 is the hashtag. Uh, top 30 tomorrow. Yes, it is. So you haven't missed that yet. Listen, if you've not seen that before, even if you have, don't miss it. If the weather stays fine, it will be the fastest the cars go all weekend. Gareth Evans is down in his shed, uh, doing a bit, bit of work on a 144th scale Harrier at this evening. And if you've got anything you want to speak to us to, at Spectatainment. Peter! Two hours to go in this session, and we're starting to see the first. It's beyond the gloaming now. We're into twilight now, aren't we? This, this is starting to get interesting as far as the light levels are concerned. This could be our golden period of this qualifying session because the track is completely dry. There is still forward, plenty of forward vision for the drivers, but probably only for the next 20 or 30 minutes. So the drivers who are out there uh, at the moment, and at the moment, I am pleased to say, and I've probably just jinxed it, no slow zones and no code <laughs> 60s. So uh, there you go. Wait wait for one to pop on the time screen now. But uh, yeah, good opportunity for the, for the drivers to set their fastest times of the day and for those sp9 cars that aren't already qualified into uh into q2 into top qualifying they're uh, yeah they need to get a move on yeah it, it's uh always an important part of the 
the whole weekend and the lead up, Bruce, to get the blue light, to get the the top 30. Um, there the used to be a couple of spaces still up for grabs. I'm not sure that that's still the case now. Have, have we got the top 30 all qualified in now for tomorrow evening? Well, I'm going to take a look at that later on. Now, I just can't drag my eye away from what's happening on the track. This is the golden time, as Peter said. It's the magical time. This is when the drivers, you know, they don't want to do the early stuff. They want to have this crossover period. It's so spectacular. And I love this tweet from Ian McCarthy, regular fan of the show. He said, I do love this time of year. There's more overtaking action on a quali lap on the Nordschleife yeah. than there is in some endurance races. And I think that's absolutely true but it does focus the mind that uh, one little slip up with traffic and the whole show comes tumbling down for a totally. particular entry. Uh, I think we we found, with our talk of the Japanese care cars, we have found a gap in the market here. Endurance racing with care cars. I've, I've, Matt Dean says, the Mazda Demio, another classic from the era of great small cars and a favorite of Gran Turismo drivers starting off. Uh, hello to Gamer Guy joining us live from Marysville, Ohio. Uh, which isn't that where Honda have their plant over there? I think it is. Um, Go Green Racing. Uh, the 110 being towed back at the moment, and the 110 under tow is the. If I scroll through this screen over here. The Teichmann Racing KTM Crossbow. All right, so that might give us another slow zone. Hello to Big Train 45. Thank you for your kind words. And, oh, favourite cars, 289 Cobra Roadster, Roadster and the original Corvette Grand Sport. Well, we've moved on to a completely different uh, section of, of car culture there and I'm not going to argue with that big train no doubt absolutely fantastic Christy joining us now watching and listening sound and vision radio-show.co.uk good to have your company uh, we have full audio coverage across the weekend as well uh, and that Teichman Racing KTM Crossbow is indeed being pushed back behind the barrier and that is at Flans Garden. Very fast part of the circuit there, Peter. Yeah, so the the, uh, the KTM crossbow of Felix von der Laden, the number 110 car, had ground to a complete halt Correct. just over the blind crest at ex Muller, which is not the place you want to grind to a halt if there's anywhere here. So it's obviously got going again and then ground to another halt a couple of sectors later at Flansgarten, which is agonisingly close to the pits, but close but no cigar, unfortunately. Here's a great question. Debate this on Twitter at uh, RSL underscore studio and uh, use the hashtag RSL N24. Stathis Koko says, why are there so few non-German GT3 marks? here is it purely marketing the race is very very prestigious it's an international event now is there a simple reason for it um i'm not sure there is status but i'll take listen I'll, I'll we've got another two hours tonight and i'll take your any of you listening or watching around the world i'll, I'll take your submissions on this there hasn't been a non-german mark winning here since the Vipers, the Zach Speed Vipers, Bruce. Um, we had some Fords before that, but even, I mean, the, the Vipers even then was a German team, but it, it was, up until relatively recently, it was very much a German race. It's got international prestige now. Um, Bentley have been here, Aston Martin have been here for the top class, although not this year. Ferrari, mm, sort of not really pushed it there are plenty of other gt3 manufacturers but it has been the germans that have that have dominated here is there a simple reason for it, is it or is it just a a very german race well, well I, I think if you're taking the top class the sp9 class um of course the german manufacturers that compete within that are desperately keen to win this race as one of the two 24-hour races along with the spa 24 hours which are their stamping grounds and but I'm still surprised, of course, 
Bentley went X Works and GT3. Otherwise, I'm sure they'd have some car hit cars here. Um, Lamborghini are doing doing their best, but they've only got two cars in the race, the two Ferraris. Um, but the real work set is at all German, German crews because this race is just so important. We'd love to see other cars competing in uh, GT3 and SP9. And I think in years to come, we will get it. But just glancing back over the history of the 40, 48 running to this race, every single car is German manufactured. You talked about the Fords, but of course they were manufactured in Germany. The yeah, Ford in 81, it, um, you know, the Escorts before them, the Sierra Cosworth in 87. It's those prize of Vipers, 1999, 2001, and 2002. Since then, the closest we've got to uh, a non-German car winning was uh, we had a Dodge Viper second in 2007, and we had a Ferrari team farm back as recently as 2010. But it really is actually quite depressing reading if you're any a manufacturer from any other country other than Germany. But you know what? Here's the challenge. Come and play. See if you can win. I remember the year that the 911 flywheel hybrid ran here, Peter. I was trackside commentating, and there was a real big battle between that and the... Now, who was it? Was it one of the Felbermeyer farm back cars? But it was, a, it was a Ferrari, and I couldn't decide what would be the biggest story if one of those two cars had won, whether it would be the hybrid winning or whether it would be the the Ferrari uh, winning. And the Ferrari, by the way, that I think I'm right in saying, had run in GTE specification the previous weekend at the at the Spa, six hours. Um, as, as it happened, neither of them won, um, at, which was bizarre. But it, it has been. I think Bruce and I talked about this on uh, Midweek Motorsport. There are only three or four non-German entered teams, never mind the manufacturer, in the whole of the, the top class. And two of those, or, sorry, one of those is GPX, which is Klingenhaus. Indeed, yes. And well, actually, if you're, for those who are fans of the prancing horse and are maybe uh, looking a little glum with all these uh, German manufacturers up the front, well, Luca Ludwig has, uh, has struck back for, um, for Ferrari actually gone fourth quickest in SP9 in his Ferrari 488 uh, and less than a second off the ultimate pace of the uh, number six Mercedes. Now, if you recognise that second name, folks, Ludwig, that you <laughs> that is son of double Le Mans winner Klaus, um, who, of course, won Le Mans in 1979 with the Whittington brothers, who... Of course, have it. Well, we could we could fill the rest of the evening with stories about about those guys. Probably best not to, because I'm not sure no. we've got the uh, RSL lawyer on standby. Uh, to be honest, the the 114 Teichmann, the orange and black KTM crossbow. Um, I've never professed to be any kind of automotive engineer, particularly not in the specialised areas of. Uh, suspension geometry but even I can tell you that the left rear suspension is not in good shape I'm not even sure whether the well actually I think the wheel nuts come off that on the left rear wheel yes it has so it's not suspension it's a rear wheel nut that's gone astray on that car um, it was sitting rather at a jaunty angle, uh, but then a clo on closer inspection, I can clearly see that the wheel nut was absent. And in fact, the wheel has come adrift from that left rear now as it's been pulled back by the Mercedes uh, out of the way at Flans Garden. Um, Maurice GT8 says, there are 24 hour race with K cars and he sent me a link. And I have retweeted it because you can sign me up for that right now. Right now. I need to find where that is. I'm Good right one, there. Well, <laughs> yes. almost, almost certainly. So there are K-Car 24-hour races. Uh, Stephen Lloyd saying, interesting conversation. Shane Bentley never got the Gen 3 car to the Nürburgring. Never say never. Jack Shalowski. Hello, Jack. Long time, no speak. 
for this year in particular, I suggest the possibility of long quarantines in and out of Germany, coupled with maybe having a car shipped over, um, makes it very difficult for uh, some people to run there. Yeah, you're absolutely right here as well. Pontiac, Michigan, Joe Ginsinger, joining us from the automotive capital of the world. Mark Thomas is in Houston, Texas, uh, loving the Foxtail Manta. And if you want to get in touch with us, please do, because we've got plenty of time to fill over the weekend. Uh, Peter Mackay, Bruce Jones joining me, John Hinder from the Global Broadcast Centre with Peter Snowy Snowden, who has raced here, Envy, and Joe Bradley, who has done plenty of laps around here in virtual reality, which I suspect Peter has uh, as well. They'll join us at the weekend for the race. And we will be 24 hours straight through our RS1 audio field feed, which is all free, with no blocks, wherever you are in the world. We're getting to the bottom of a couple of uh, video blocks on YouTube that uh, may be put into place for the race. Uh, we'll try and get you some news on that. If you go to our Facebook area, it's Radio Show Limited Listeners Collective. And Eve, the responsible adult, is working that out with our colleagues at Nürburgring TV. Christian Cronius in the BMW M6 GT3 out of the circuit and for once, relatively empty track. And the headlights beginning to pick out the important areas as he goes across the bridge and up towards the little jump at uh, Fluke Platz, now heading quite steeply uphill, actually, as he carves his way through the Eiffel. Uh, actually, completely nonsense there, Hindhoff, the darkness showing me up. He was coming down Flansgard towards the second carousel. My apologies. Now into Gallenkopf before he heads on to the long Dottinger Hall. What is that, two and a half kilometres, something like that. Traffic ahead, got the flashes on. Drags up behind though, still uses the hole in the air being made by the EMG number nine, which he goes past without too much problems down the long Dottinger Hall. Uh, and that would be the get speed, Janine Hill as was, Janine Schofner now, Maury Krantz, Marcus Paltella, and uh, Maxi Sule, Maxime Sule. I, saw, I read somewhere, and I, I think it was Janos Wimford who sent this to me, thanks Janos, that uh, Janine's husband John is on the list to go into space with NASA on one of the first customer flights doing his training, uh, I think, at the moment. Wish him all the best on that. And even though I'm... Even though I'm absolutely petrified of heights, I envy that. Sorry, Peter, go ahead. To Cronje is quickest. Oh, really? You could just watch those sectors going through. And of course, that is Excellent. a Yokohama tyre. Very good. Uh, a Yokohama shot BMW for Walking Horse Motorsport, the team owned by Ernie Walking Horse. Then... Yeah, very quick. Goes 1.2 seconds quicker than anyone. So brilliant stuff from that from Christian Cronjes in that number 101 car from the former Spa 24 Hour winner and former VLN champ back in 2012. It's one of the Lambos having a oh, a bit of a uh, off track excursion getting around a BMW. Do you know? When I looked at that. I thought that was the Land Audi in that green and white colour, but uh, absolutely well spotted by. Peter, that was a Lamborghini. Bad news for the Cayman number 87. This is the sort of um, zebra coloured car at the front end of that machine. And it's the GTS SP4T. Just three drivers I've got on my list for that. Andreas Schellertz, Ernst uh, Therin and Stefan Brenner. And that car's come into contact with the uh, GT tyres sponsored black and yellow 
Golf GTI. And there's a wee bit of damage on the right front of that. We st guys, we've really started something. Bruce, this is, I think this is you and I's fault. We've started something with the key car conversation. Jonathan Main, who's a proud Welshman, says, I've got a I've got Daihatsu equipment in my garage, but it needs a bit of TLC. But honestly, if if there was any kind of racing for K-Cars at the Nürburgring, I'd cage it and get it out. <laughs> well, well, John, look how popular I think it's last weekend. Was there a 24-hour race for Citroen C1s? C1s like a Silver modern iteration? Yeah. So, so, but what I like, I think of this conversation as a bit of brain training ahead of the 24 hours. And uh, certainly... Our listeners and viewers around the world have not disappointed. They've dug deep already, but that means they're going to be the sort of people capable of remembering the 100 and, well, 500 drivers spread across 125 entries. And, and you do need to be, you know, on your metal, whether you're watching, listening, or indeed com competing here. And I think it's a, it's a great little gambit to get the ball rolling. What little points I want to make, John? You said uh, coming out of Galvin Pop, I've just checked what the distance is from there, from that very point through to the start finish line it's a whisker over two miles it's almost precisely two miles wow. or, or 3.2 kilometers of which what 95 percent is absolutely flat chat yeah it, it never ceases to amaze me i've been driven there many times myself albeit um on either tourist laps or closed industry days how late the gt3s break when they come through the compression at the end of the dotiger hurt at Tiergarten and then up to the, the final chicane. They are well up the incline before they even think about breaking. Now, all right, you've, you've got the upward hill there to, to slow you down. And then they aim right at the edge of that piece of Armco on the left-hand side that's got the, the red markings on it, knowing that if they aim pretty much straight for it, they will be go they're going fast enough to drift past it. it Differently wired, Peter, these guys, aren't they? Oh, yeah, you can say that again, that's for sure. And, uh, well, a notable performance uh, tonight from Axel Jeffries in the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini Huracan. So the Italians are fighting back here um, with uh, that car up to fourth. But I feel in the next 20 minutes or so, I know they said this 20 minutes ago, but I feel in the next 20 minutes we're going to see a flurry of fast lap times. And... Also, a certain K. Estra Esquire has got on board the uh, 911 Manti car, so stand back. Uh, uh, it's a good, very good point there, Peter. Is, is a few incidents in the last 10 minutes or so, and I just think it's the less experienced drivers just not knowing where their braking points are until they've just driven past them as they're just struggling to get used to racing from grey into black from evening into night and I think it tends to be the drivers with less experience here in the sort of junior class cars if you will like the uh, GT tyres uh, golf that are catching themselves out but uh, for, the, for the big guns they do this almost John don't they by muscle oh. memory for example bum, 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 in their mind they visualise the lap this is the point at which yes here I am at that point and they're turning in they're already sort of free turns you do when, you, when you're sort of racing if you, if you really love your skiing you know you don't just turn into the corner you've already thought about it already you're, you're sensing and tensing and uh, picking that point and so much that's a magnificent point to finish that race because so much of this circuit many race tracks actually but because this is such a long track so much of it is a sequence of corners and that's how you learn it you don't learn it as oh this turn then that corner, then the next turn, then the next corner. It has to be thought of as a whole. And that, to me, makes it... It's your favourite country road, the Nürburgring. That's how Klaus Graf described it to me many years ago. And he said, that's how you've got to treat it. It's your favourite country road, except there's nothing coming the other way, generally speaking. Something's gone horribly wrong. And... You have to treat it like that and run. And in those days, he was saying that even the race, they ran 85, 90 percent because he couldn't run any quicker. That's gone then. That's gone. When we were on track days, or we were doing industry pool days, or um, manufacturer days, and I was taking people around in Astons and such like, then there was maybe 20 cars out there, and therefore sometimes you didn't see another car. 
therefore you were leaning on it a bit more. You, you didn't have to worry about what was over the rise because you all had radios and anybody who had a problem you were going to find out about it. Now, all right, when you, particularly when you've got people on board with you, you are not pushing it 100% nowhere near. But now what we see at the front of the field at GT3 level is is what we heard from Klaus Backler, what we heard from Adam Christodoulou, what we heard from Philip Eng um, earlier on this week. It is, your thumb comes off the pit lane speed limiter, you are 100% until your thumb goes back on the laps later in the race. Well, I, I, I think I think it was, was it Klaus? I think it was Klaus that said, there's no room for even 95% anymore. It is a series of sprints separated by pit stops and fuel tyres and possibly a driving chip. Extraordinary stuff. It really, really is. And, and we should celebrate the reliability, by the way, of these GT3 cars. Based on road cars, let's not forget, the kind of reliability we get out of these, the kind of tolerances that these road car-derived engines run to. Your road car, sitting outside right now, the kind of tolerances that they run to now, it would have been dreamt about 20 years ago in motor racing, at the highest level of motor racing. The kind of reliability that we get from even highly tuned road cars nowadays would have been dreams 15, 20 years ago at Le Mans, at here, at the Nürburgring. Uh, and, it's, and it's an extraordinary thing. It, it really is. And, and we should celebrate what motor racing does for us as, as as road car drivers, particularly in terms of tyres, I mean, we've talked about that a lot, but tyres, EFI, electronic fuel injections, the control systems, the way they all talk together, marvellous. Uh, Greg Higgins, I'll come back in a sec. I, I want to throw this in, um, Peter, if you don't mind. Greg Higgins, questions that perhaps we're embarrassed to ask. Greg, we've all made a career out of uh, asking embarrassing questions, so never a problem. At RSL underscore studio. Hashtag RSL N24. Um, how do the pit stops work, says Greg? It appears they need to do an extra lap of the GP circuit every time they come in. I do listen every year, but it's shame to say that I've never really watched for a variety, for a variety of reasons. Hello from Cork in the Emerald Isle, what my grandmother would still call if she was alive for Irish Free State. Greg, no silly questions. At this time of the week, that's... Uh, corned off area from the transition from the Nürburgring Nordschleife on the Grand Prix circuit is there to make people do that extra lap of the Grand Prix circuit before they come in. Also, if you want, you can come out of the pits, you can do an installation lap and decide whether you go back onto the Nürburgring Nordschleife and either come into the pits or go back down the front straight again. That's why the cones are there. In the race, that will be gone. So you will enter the pit lane off the end of the run onto the Grand Prix circuit at, at what would have been Coca-Cola Curve, as I still want to call it. But straight off the end of the tear garden and the final chicane. So no daft questions, Greg. Glad you asked that. Well, I'm sure I have to explain that again before the end. Sorry, Peter, go ahead. Uh, I was off on my little soapbox talking about various other things before we answered that question. I think it was actually Bruce. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yes. Yeah, no, the point I wanted to make, John, you were talking about the unbelievable reliability. Yes. Fact, I just want to throw in, in fact, we've got a new fastest time. Suddenly, Julian Andlau has wow. put the Rutronic Racing number three Porsche top eight minutes. Eight minutes, 21.4 for Andlau. Some of the drivers are racing these cars all around the world, almost every weekend. Last weekend, they had the six hours at uh, Port Ricard. Then you've got the ADAC GT Championship, the GT World Challenge Sprint Championships and, and around the world. And so these cars, they have to be strong. And their, their performance and reliability has just kept on improving. But these are cars that have worked super, super hard. And I think the formula really does work because you look back at earlier runnings 30 years ago with the Nürburgring 24 hours and obviously fewer cars finished than started, but sometimes only half of the field made it to the end. Now we're looking at far greater percentages that uh, go the full 24 hours. So accolades all round. Yeah. Uh, Geris Mazos Zapatis. All this kick car talk reminds me of the conversations in the night hours of a 20. Yeah, we've started that a bit early. 
You're right, get up. That is... I'm sh Listen, Bradley is going to be on during the night. Snowy's going to be on during the night. If we don't get the Bradley, this is how we want to form Formula Libre race in a Formula Ford at Snetterton in the pouring rain. If we don't get that story again, we'll be very disappointed. But absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Ian McCarthy says, nothing coming the other way on your country road, as described by Klaus Graf, but you do get an assortment of course vehicles and different way to any other track. Country roads mentality, but on steroids. Can't disagree with it, with any of that, to be honest. Mark Finkelhock's behind the wheel of the Audi Sport Team Car Collection. Uh, number two, in 10th position at the moment for the Audi R8 LMS. He's in traffic at the moment, just going through uh, Brunchen and heading up through the ice curve in the red and black Audi. And right in front, one of the Falcon Porsches. And again, I forgot to fire up the, the tracker, but I think that is the 44 car that's right ahead of him. I stand to be corrected on that with if it is it's Klaus Backler at the wheel of that and of course it isn't is it no so it must be the other one it's Thomas Pliny at the wheel of the 33 Falcon I had two to pick from Peter and dot 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 well I have to I was trying to <laughs> of course there is uh, a couple of things that give away the difference and that's the front caps of the mirrors and the front dive planes. But of course, we were looking at the back, back of, it, so of the car. No use yeah, at all. Um, so yeah, that that, that so we do apologise for our, our audio listeners. We aren't be able to identify it. But yes, you were right. Uh, Klaus Backler driving that car. Marcus Will Winklehawk uh, looking like on a well, he's certainly gone a purple sector uh, on this lap. And if Marcus was to win uh, this weekend, he would equal the all-time record. Uh, held by Timo Bernard, Roman Dumas, and I think a couple of others on five, five. wins. Yeah, absolutely. Probably Pedro Lamy, I would reckon, would be in that mix. Pedro Lamy, absolutely. Okay, yes. uh -huh. It's been... We've covered this race since 2007, and what a time for us to come on board and cover this race, because there's been a new lap distances, people winning for the fifth time, uh, Manti winning four times in a row. Uh, Manti coming back from a lap down and winning by two laps. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that. Uh, we've had a really good time covering this race. And I, I have a suspicion that if the weather holds this year, I, yeah, we've had some interruptions as well. Seven and a bit hours delay. No, more than that. Nine hours delay. Nine, nine and a half. Yeah. A couple of years ago, it wasn't it, with yeah, the rain? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but my goodness, we've had some stunning racing. And all of the things that we were talking about, Bruce, earlier on, about reliability, what that's led to, and we can, you can't relate this 24 hour race to any other 24 hour race. Every 24 hour race has its own character, its own atmosphere. So, yes, there's a Daytona 24. Yes, there's an Urbering 24. Yes, there's a Dubai 24 hour. And of course, there's Le Mans 24s and many more. But they all have their own character. But the one thing we can say, Bruce, that all the things we talked about earlier about reliability has given us much closer racing. When I first went to Le Mans, if the winning margin was in single figures of laps, you thought you'd had a close race. Uh, absolutely. And I think that's why, OK, this year we got restricted number of spectators allowed onto the onto the hallowed grounds. But um, you know, back back when I started coming to this event, where one of the whole features of it was to walk out in the countryside and see the castles that people had made. Some brought their own banks to assemble like a, like, like a camp. Others just simply built them out of beer barrels. And they got larger and larger, but the racing wasn't as close with as much depth. The top handful of cars, the top dozen cars, or maybe the top half dozen cars would be racing tooth and nail. But if one of them fell or failed, which inevitably happened, then your battle got really, really reduced. Yes. But the fact we've got so many full-time pro drivers, which is, that I reckon, you know, despite sort of the, the vagaries of the world economy over the past 20 years, the number of drivers outside America, which used to be the home of the pro driver, who are getting paid to go racing cars is at a record height. Uh, and therefore, the quality of these drivers means that the racing stays super safe, uh, um, close 
at the top. One driver just looking out there, Patrick Niederhauser, a driver who's been on Audi's books for a handful of years. He's one of those drivers who could very easily take a win this year, but a, a real mixture at the top end. But it is the fact that racing will last from the, the start to the end. 24 hours and we'll have more than a handful of cars in the top couple of laps. I think barring disaster, that's what we can expect. And that certainly wasn't the tune even 25 years ago where you could have a two, three, four, five lap winning margin. It's so much closer now. Yeah, totally agree. Um, and it, 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 I mean, in some ways, Bruce, we've got a generation of endurance fans who have, have become used to that. And if it isn't side by side in the last lap after 24 hours at the Nürburgring Nordschleife, you get a bit disappointed, which, which I kind of understand because that's, that's what they're used to. But the great thing about endurance racing, I always think, is that the story unfolds as you're watching it. And that's why, like watching test, test cricket, which I was trying to keep up with uh, today with England versus New Zealand at, at Lords, you never know when the turning point of the race is going to happen. And, and that's why you've almost got to keep watching. It draws you in, even when you think, oh, I'm going to put the bed now. It, it kind of draws you in and, and keeping up to date with it is, is actually quite important. Yeah, and one of the, the real hard things, we, we've said it a million times, the lap is 25 kilometres long. Yeah. If you just pass pit in when suddenly the weather, as it has a habit of doing in the Eiffel Forest, becomes cataclysmic, you've got an awfully long way to go tiptoeing around, possibly aquaplaning on a circuit the previous time you've been around that particular sequence of corners and it's dry. So you could be going beautifully for a dozen hours, do nothing wrong, your pit stops are all bang on, your setup is great, your quartet of drivers is performing beautifully, a wonderful slip, a bang. You may not, but you talked earlier about uh, coming back and winning by two laps despite despite going several laps down. Yeah. It is still possible, but it's in fact around the next corner, there's always something lurking, and here with that monster long lap around the Nordschleife, one little slip up can cost you hours of tip-top work. Hours, absolutely. Right, Jonathan, thank you. Jonathan Mir, thank you very much. Nothing better, nothing better, he says, than the RSLs due to your chats and tangents in the dead of night at any 24-hour race. It's what we listen for. Love that it started early, yeah, possibly a bit early, but we'll dial that back in and um, give you some news on what's going on. Because, Peter, we have a new fastest lap in qualifying. That we do, yes. It's the Retronic Racing Porsche of uh, Sven Muller uh, on board that car. Although I think it was Julian Andlauer that set the time and did one little lap around the GP circuit and handed over to uh, to Muller. So yes, Retronic Porsche up the front. So in, in the moment we have Porsche from BMW, from Mercedes, from Porsche again. Um, so very difficult and of course there's an Audi and a Lamborghini there as well in the top six so everyone represented uh, very well indeed and of course not all of the top cars are running the Michelin tyre, the Yokohama Shod Walkenhorst BMW sitting second overall right now. Good to see that variety at the top of the field Lamborghini, a lot of people's uh, favourites and uh, they're towards the show. great to see the Conrad name up there as well, Franz Conrad, real stalwart of endurance racing for very, very many years. His car sitting in what seventh position uh, at the moment. Uh, Rutronic, Bruce, uh, a, a name, well, a, 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 a team that has a lot of well known drivers in it. What about the team? Well, you always have to keep an eye for teams competing in. The various championships around the world and Rutronic, HCB Rutronic, named HCB was uh, Hans Christoph Baylor, who's the founder, was a team that sort of seemed to come from nowhere a couple of years ago uh, and went away with the title in the ADAC GT Masters Series with uh, two drivers who are competing this weekend, Patrick Niederhauser and Kelvin van der Linde. Ironically, they're running for other teams this weekend, but it just goes to show that if you can get the right approach and... Um, the right drivers in your car, you can go and win titles. But five years ago, you know, what was this team? We knew the team, other teams at the top end of the field, Falcon Motorsports, Walton Horse Motorsport, who are running third at the moment. 
they had come through on the Spa 24 hours, but Rootronic, watch out for them. They've only got the one car, though, so uh, they really can't afford any slip-ups uh, there. But it's great to have variety and good to see their silver portion right at the sharp end of the field by a margin of six tenths of a second now as Klaus Battler's just banged in a very quick lap to go second fastest. Sorry, it was Tobias Muller, not Sven Muller. I knew I would make that mistake. It's all right. Um, <laughs> there's... there's Jorg as well. So, yes, oh and there, there are many <laughs> Mullers. Uh, I'm not sure what the collective noun for Mullers are. A much of Mullers, perhaps. A uh, Thomas much of Mullers, uh, but perhaps. That Porsche's first and second now with Rutronic and Falcon with uh, a new best time for Klaus Backler in the Falcon Motorsports number 44. Last time around six tenths of a second over eight and a half minutes, near enough. 822 0 against 821 4. Valkenhorst still sitting in third. And Peter, we've been talking about the tyre battles. And how good is it to see the different tyre manufacturers at the sharp end of the field? Absolutely fantastic. Three different tyre manufacturers, Falcon, Yokohama and Michelin, all in the top three. And that is what we want to see. Now, that gives us an impression of what we can see in the dry. Although I have a suspicion, and I don't want to pour cold water on what is a tantalising <laughs> prospect. If the rain comes, the Michelin man will smile. It seems Possibly. to be. Well, yes, it seems to be. But um, it was quite a while before Falcon in the US won a dry race when they were competing. They, they know how to build wet weather tyres as well. Uh, and this is such an important race that there will be a bit of jiggery and, if you will, Bruce, porkery going on. Um, mm with what's going on with the tyres, the regulations state quite categorically that a tyre that you make available to your supply teams has to be available to everybody else. So I'm not suggesting that there is anything going on there, but you know that the tyre manufacturers are putting as much effort into this as, as the, the automotive manufacturers are. Absolutely. Um... <laughs> The shop window is established, it's here, it's now, and also I think the prestige of winning a 24-hour race on a circuit that A, is as difficult as it is, and B, it seems to be struck by many seasons worth of weather in a lot of the runnings of the, the day and night special. Uh, you get added prestige, you know, your tyres are quick, but they're brilliant in all circumstances. That's what you want to put across as your message, and that's why the like of Falker Motorsports have run teams here for years. They've got the ultimate testing grounds, they have to go out and do it and make it work, but uh, that is indeed one of the real draws of this, this fabulous event. Um, informed by Yoda's uncle, that of course the collective noun for Müllers is a corner of Müllers. Oh, very oh, good. Very yeah. good. <laughs> very good indeed. Wicker Bill got in there as well. Bunch of Mullers. It's uh, a corner or a multi pack. Very good indeed. See, that's what we're working with. You, the collective, are working with us here on the Radio Show Limited Network of audio and visual channels right across the weekend. All of the N24. We've got ELMS as well. If you uh, feel the need in the breaks to. Go and watch some short circuit racing from Ricard. It'll be Johnny Palmer and Graham Goodwin in the RSL commentary booth for that one this weekend. And uh, weather forecast for that is very interesting as well down at Ricard. Circuit that is not too far away from the south coast of France. An hour and 21 minutes to go. And a new second place time, Bruce Jones. It's a Ferrari, Ferrari fans. Get on your horse and prance. The number 22 <laughs> car, WTM, powered by Phoenix. And it's Daniel Kylvitz. I singled him out uh, before this event as the star in that car. But he's just 0.179 of a second down on the Rutronic Porsche now. So he, he laps in a very, very cracking pace. And we've seen that, John, haven't we? Just chipping away. Moved into the top six with Luca uh, 
no, sorry, Ludwig's not in that car. Uh, but just going better and better. But Calvitz, you know, he is very quick in whatever he drives and uh, just goes and proves it. So there's another team that you've got Rutronic. You wouldn't have picked them as a car that necessary a team that would be right at the top or WTM powered by Phoenix. But there they are, first and second. Yeah, that is very impressive. Very impressive indeed for that Ferrari splitting the two Porsches. In fact, John, if I may just come back, I was about to suggest that Luca Ludwig was in that car. Of course, he's in the Octane 126 car, but that was sixth when we last saw it. It's now moved down to tenth, but two Ferraris in the top ten. That's all they could ask for at this, this point. And uh, I think they have quite a smile with an hour and 20 remaining in this second qualifying session. Peter, what's your impressions of this first session into the darkness tonight, just after 10 o'clock, 10 past 10, Nürburgring? It's dark on the Grand Prix circuit, it's darker still, and we're still not in a full dark at the moment. What are your impressions of seeing uh, full metal racing on the Nordschleife? Uh, it's, uh, it's a pinch yourself moment, really, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, this is mo motorsport at its absolute first class, world class level. And isn't it wonderful that such, a, such an incredibly unique event is allowed it to continue? in these you know we talk about you know things getting old you know getting too dangerous and things like that but you look at the you look at here at the Nürburgring you look at the effort that the organizers and the marshals put in to make sure that this event is as safe as it can be and you look at the I mean I tell you what if you ever see a, a road in the UK clogged up uh, because of an accident get the Nürburgring marshals on the case they'll clear it up in no time um, it, it is it's just incredible and you, you know what's amazing is is that uh, I remember speaking to Kevin Escher about this the lap record holder here at the, the Nürburgring in, in the NLS and he said to me he says even the, it might it might be a, a Renault Clio or a BMW 3 Series he says but, but he says the, the driver inside will be top class N not just anybody oh. gets let out on the Nürburgring you've got to do your earn your fright well uh, Bruce what we were seeing in the in the preview on Midway Motorsport on Wednesday that's available for download or listen on demand by the way at radio-show.co.uk look at the the Hyundai drivers in the uh, in the what is effectively a TCR class Mark Bessing's in there and, and he's He's been right at the very sharp end of this race in, in past years. Absolutely, he has, John. But again, that, that's why we have 122 cars at a set time. You've got to look the whole way down the entry list. We've got former winners like Volker Strychek still out there in that Opel Manta. But the experience isn't only, and the speed isn't only in the SP9, the top class for FIA GC3 cars. There are star drivers dotted down. And you know what? Manufacturers like Hyundai, what do they want? They want speed, of course, but they want experience because they want their car to perform to its very best in all the vagaries you get here on the Nürburgring Nordschleife. So, Bassing, one of those drivers you have to go looking for down the order, and he'll do that gold standard job that he's been doing for two decades. Got a news, and I'm indebted to Nikolai B, who's tweeted us at RSL Studio using the hashtag RSLN24. Um, Respect and discipline here is so important. And already getting news of a five-place grid penalty for uh, failing to uh, respect flags out on the Nordschleife. Uh, that is the number 41 AMG there. Also, the number 172. And that has been moved to the back of its starting group that's the auto house honda civic tcr move to the back of its starting group for a flag and the speeding effects or steward's decisions coming through and just want to correct one thing there john actually it's car number 40 41 doesn't exist ah. but it's kenneth hire at the middle yeah. 10 key racing mate. team the black and gold mercedes no it's written as 41 on the official bulletin we go with that but i'll just uh, Add a little bit of top spin and make Excellent. a car 40. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Bruce. I skipped through my entry list and couldn't see it, and I thought it might have been a, a, a change to that. In the pit lane at the moment is a very pretty GT Silver Porsche, which is getting a brake change. And I think that was the Rutronic 
car that at the moment is sitting at the top of the standings, Peter. Yeah, correct. It's in the pits, oh, in the sorry, garage. Bruce. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely number three. And um, that's driven by Julian Andlauer, who set the time. Roman Dumas, Tobias Muller, and Lawrence Fantor. Oof, not a bad line up there. Certainly, Tobias Muller will be hoping his, his massive stars alongside him can propel him up to the front. But right now, they are at the front, albeit with the brake change. But, John, we talked about how this session, three hours, they'd already had an hour and a half earlier in the day. It's going through the process, going through the procedure, making sure any novice here, not that there are many novices at the top end, get their night laps in. Well, and, and actually that is a question that we often get asked. How do you get to race at the Nürburgring? I'd love to do it. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, you could have Lewis Hamilton if he decided he wanted to come here. He can't walk into this race. He can't even walk into a Nürburgring Lengstrecker series race because even if you've got a super license from the FIA in Formula One, if you are a Daytona 500 winner, a Rolex 24 winner, it doesn't matter. You have got to go through the protocol of getting your permit, your Nürburgring permit. There was a really great program on Sky Sports F1 where Martin Brundle went through the whole process of doing it and ended up in the race. To start with, you've got to use cars of a certain horsepower. And then if you want to step up, you've uh, got to do a certain amount of laps before you're allowed into the Nürburgring 24, which is why we always see a very packed set of grids in the early NLS races. Drivers who are, are getting their, their permits. I, I, I'm desperately annoyed with myself. I got an opportunity a few years ago to, to go and do it. Um, and for a variety of reasons, mostly involved with actually having work to do I never got to do it and it's one of the things I really kick myself about and again you know I'm an international C FIA holder FIA license holder which means I can race pretty much anywhere in the world but not as of right at the Nürburgring and I'm I'm honest with you I think that's absolutely right it's absolutely right and we have seen permits taken away from drivers during the race, Bruce, uh, we've seen that happen down through the years where they have not respected slow zones, flags, etc. And they're politely told, uh, you know, get back in the car again. And if you want to come back, you're going to have to re-qualify for your permit. And I think here, here, more than anywhere else in the world, that has to be right, doesn't it? I was going to say two words and they rhyme. Quite right. <laughs> Yes. And in fact, through the, as it's gone from evening into now full darkness on the Nordschleife, there are still a few drivers, maybe because their cars are easy to pick out because they're bright colours, that are really in some of the production classes that are going to have to learn and be told a little bit more and have it stressed to them about how they keep out of the way. It's not an easy thing. If you're in a production class car and you've got a GC3 car racing in the SB9 class at top coming up at you out of the darkness, you can probably panic a little bit, but it's about, as we know, in multi-class racing, consistency of line and not altering your position more than you can get away with. And so uh, a polite word in the air saying, OK, we've looked at that TV footage of you. What you did wrong there was you went one way, then you went the other. Yeah. But it is a learning process, but certainly uh, maybe some of it became a little more plain with the, the flash of the headlights, the flare of the headlights coming off the tail end of the slower car. But certainly we've seen a few moments of evasion. We saw one earlier from Nick Yaloli. Uh, I'm trying to think who else we saw, but uh, almost all the top drivers would have had a scare or a moment or two in which they've had to adapt their line. So let's get consistency of line, but the officials are very, very good yes. at letting a driver know. It's not it's not anything they've done wrong, but they could have done it better. And that's, right. that's how sports coaching should be. I think that should, should be the same. We, we talk about it here at the Nürburgring, because the unique nature of the Nordschleifer, I think that should be uh, applied everywhere. I had a very long and interesting conversation with Emmanuel Pirro uh, when he was first appointed to be one of the Formula One stewards and he was talking to me about uh, Code 60s. Uh, I think it might have even be, been before Formula One adopted their version of Code 60 which is virtual safety car uh, and he was asking me about how it worked and, and why I thought it was good or bad or indifferent etc. 
Uh, and at the end of this huge conversation we had about slowing people down, he says, of course, if drivers respected we have yellow flags, we wouldn't have to do all this. And I looked at them and he went, yeah, I know, I know, Porter turned gamekeeper. He was absolutely right. Uh, talking about knee and misses, Peter, Frank Stippler, Stippy. My goodness, his eyes might have opened a little bit wider recently. Well, we know that Frank Stippler is a four-time winner. He is a, a real king of calm. He's won three times in the last decade in this event, one of the very best out there, and very, very nearly ended up in the back of the GT Tire ST8 class Audi. With uh, Now, I'm just trying to find who's on board that car right now. That's the Pippa Man and Christina Nielsen car. I'm trying to find on the timing screen where they are right now, the 53 car. I'll have a scan. But a very I'll close a one indeed. Yeah. I think it was at Klostertal, which is oh, about as fast. quick a point as you can have such a moment. Yeah, and it's it's quick through there. Not a lot of, well, there's very few places on the outer reaches of the circuit where um, there's room to have those kind of incidents. I'm indebted to Joe Bradley as well. Um, try not to faint yourself down when you're talking, Heindel. Uh We were talking about the Retronic Racing Porsche in the pits, the number three car, which is at the top of the timings at the moment, having improved to an 8.21.4 this evening. There were changing brake discs, but as Joe, who has uh, some experience, some very good experience of running teams in both sprint and endurance races down through the years, points out uh, they're probably weren't changing those brakes because of where they would have been bedding in and matching a new set of discs to a new set of parts. So do a couple of laps and then take them off, put those away at the one side and go, we know we're going to have to drip to change discs and pads, rotors and pads during the race. That will be the first set of pads that we put on with that new disc. Uh, that new set of discs at some stage in the race. Augusta Farfus is getting a bit frustrated at the moment as he goes under the Bilstein Bridge towards the end of the lap. piece, massively on the flash button. Um, rather overusing it, I would say, Augusto. So he dives down the inside of the number 11 Audi currently uh, in the hands of uh, Phoenix Racing GMB Atch car is in the hands of who? Ah, Kim Louise Schramm. Yes, thank you, Bruce, uh, for I'm consulting various different screens as I'm try I would like to say that I know the entry list off by heart, but only Bruce Jones will be able to do that by the end of the weekend. Yeah, not yet, not yet, man. <laughs> I'll still never forget that year at the, at the uh, Hankook 24 Hours of Dubai when we were sitting ready to go to the airport in the evening and you were quizzing us all on the 94 car field that had been running and you knew it off by heart it was just extraordinary I've no clue how you do that Mr Jones only I've done that academically never mind <laughs> moving along yes there are so many of us who can say that why can I remember all of the words to that 1970 song but I can't remember why I've come in the kitchen uh, you know, uh, it's yep Absolutely. My dad, my dad had a slightly sterner version of it. He says, if you spent as much time in your school books as reading an autosport magazine, you'd be dangerous, Peter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, but look, you're, you're following your dream, mate. That's the, you know what? We've all had to make those decisions down through the years and, and turn our hobbies into to what we do. And there's a, in fairness, there will be a lot of people listening and watching right now who would give important parts of their anatomy. Uh, probably without any form of anaesthetic to do what we do traveling in the old days around the world but you know talking about motor racing and getting excited about it uh, and we are in a very fortunate situation and and when you make that jump the thing that i found and bruce you'll have done this as well you have to be so careful about having still having some kind of business head and working out how you're going to pay the bills when your heart says, oh, no, I want to do that. I want to. I absolutely want to go to that event. Uh, hang on, there's no money in it. But I really want to go to that event. And it's, it's really difficult, isn't it, when your passion becomes what pays your bills. And there's a, 
there's a trade-off that still has to happen there. Absolutely, John. Um, you have you have to have a business head, or you'll be you'll be out of the story. But the big problem, of course, same for teams, same for drivers, same okay? for the media. You can be promised all sorts of things, and at the eleventh hour, they don't happen. And suddenly, you've got a great big gap in your year because you're trying to plot as many working weekends as you can get in the championships you like to cover. But uh, for me, an awful lot of people who still go on that ever-increasing global jaunt uh, following the World Formula One Championship, how they make those bills pay, oh. I do not know. They're doing it because that's what they do. But I think if they started afresh, their accountant would say, what are you doing? 16 races when 12 used to be in Europe and you're based in Europe. Yes, you can do that. But when it's suddenly 23 races, of which the vast majority are now flyaways for the European teams, etc., etc. Not trying to be European-centric, it's just how it was. The story is so totally different. And, um, so it's, it's a hard game. You have to no. have a bit of guesswork as well. So isn't it great when people like Jim Glickenhaus turn up, new on the scene, um, and decide that he wants to go motor racing and he wants to put a, a car with his own name on it at Le Mans, and uh, he, at this very venue, what, five, six years ago when we first encountered Jim, resplendent, by the way, the Glicken House team in a very late house, March, um, sort of green, blue, Miami blue um, the team wear this year. He said, look, I understand that I'm going to have to put a lot of money into this. And it, it, for me, I want to do it because I want to do it. Is it a business? I'll make it a business eventually. But right now, I want to go motor racing. And, and that, that's interesting that it's still, it still elicits, Bruce, that much passion from people. He's making it into a business now. But it's still, I'm, I'm guessing, it's still a long way from washing its face. Absolutely, John. But, you know, he went in with his eyes open. So many people go in with their eyes closed and come to, they might be lucky, but most of them come to a, a sticky end financially. But, uh, you know, he had a fair amount of financial clout. But it's the, how should we say, the focus that Jim applies that's made it all really work. He's also not expecting to turn it around in a handful of years. It's a long-term project, or many long-term projects in his case, but uh, full of admiration for, for what Jim and the gang are doing. But uh, you've got to go in, of course, with enthusiasm and passion, but you've got to be realistic, or, or it's just going to come to an end that you could take years to try and dig yourself out of. Uh, you're listening to live coverage of the second qualifying session of the 2021 Total ADSC 24 hours of the Nürburgring. We're coming down to the last hour of Thursday's qualifying session uh, in what approaches full darkness now. We're coming on to half past 10 here in the Eiffel. Sunset officially on race night on Saturday is 21.38. So just around 20 minutes before 10. Still the last vestiges of light in the sky reflected from a bit of low cloud. It's actually a beautiful uh, evening and the weather forecasts, which were somewhat gloomy and sceptical, have not yet come to pass. A weather warning for this area of Germany today, Thursday, that has not yet come to pass. There is a bit of a low pressure area gathering over Central Europe, which may change the weather over the weekend but as yet we've been relatively looking and we're getting a lot of laps in and not dare I say this let me find something to to touch wood on that uh, we've not seen anybody ma major contact with either another car major contact with another car we saw one of the Cayman and the GT TCR Golf GTI earlier on with a little bit of bodywork rubbing Nobody making major contact with another car, no car making major contact with the barriers, which is very good news. Um, this is a description here, John, on, on the Twitter feed from Mark Thomas. Nothing like going through brunch at night, correct? correct? My first time I thought there was a big accident going on, but it was just disco lights and smoke from the barbecues with fantastic German fans. Doesn't that encapsulate what Absolutely it's all right. about? Absolutely right. Love it. 
love it to bits. There is a special place here for everybody. And when things get back to what approach normal, if you're a sports car, endurance fan, an automotive fan, motorsport fan, if you're watching and listening to us now here at the RSL network of audio and video channels around the world to Peter McKay, Bruce Jones and me, John Hindorf, and you haven't been to the Nürburgring, there is a gap in your motorsport knowledge, CV, career, whatever. A, a lap of the Nürburgring Nordschleife in your own road car, even at moderate speeds, will change your view of this track forever. Because trust me, it's way narrower than it even looks on anything that you're watching on the TV, on videos, whatever. And it's way quicker as well. And until you've done 20 laps or so and you can feel yourself knowing what's coming up next, it's an extraordinary place. And, and having to react to a racing track instead of knowing what's going on is something that takes a long time to get used to. And the racing here, the atmosphere here, the way that it totally takes over this region of Germany, in the way that Le Mans takes over Department 72 in France, it, it's something quite extraordinary. And yet, with an hour to go, Peter, in what is now close to full darkness, we are still seeing improvements in, in times, including at the very top of the timing screen. Yes, we've got uh, Augusto Farfus, winner of the 2020 Rolex 24, um, for BMW Junior Team. Uh, he's very much the uh, he, he's the wise owl in that team. He's got three juniors under his wing for this race, but uh, Augusto has gone quickest with an 8 minute 21.055. So very impressive from the BMW stalwart uh, as well. In fact, I don't know if you guys have you ever seen the video of uh, Augusto Farfus taking his lovely wife around the yes. Nürburgring and screaming her at him. And all he can do is is giggle and laugh. I, I don't I don't know if he's able if he lived that one down at home yet. Lo mm. <laughs> you know, someone taking their partner Ricardo Patrese with his lovely wife. Who I think she last smiled when she left the pit lane and it got worse and worse. She was beating the dash before. It's a phenomenal. I know. Just wonderful elegance. So he's on an afternoon drive. His wife clearly saw that his day job was a little more fearsome than she reckoned on. A lot of, um, I think, a little bit too much flashing, flashing from Augusto Farfus. Uh, you wouldn't be allowed to do that in Le Mans. There's a, a, a finite amount of flashes you're allowed to use. But he was on a very, very fast lap with the bill. Um, perhaps unkindly, you be the judge. Says, I wonder if you add up all the times the headlights have been flashed on the BMWs tonight, it would outweigh the number of times an indicative light has been used since BMW was formed. Harsh, I think. Same stop. Yeah, <laughs> same stop. <laughs> yes, same stop, different protocol. Uh, very good, Peter. Very good. Uh, Ian McCarthy noticing that as well uh and josh barrett's with us tonight as well hello josh uh literally as i was talking about how things had been close there was nearly an accident as we were talking i brushed past that because it didn't happen so my pronouncement of cars not coming into contact with each other was um, was still correct it was factually correct philip eng on a quick one as well coming to the end of the lap in the defending champion Rover Racing BMW. BM stopped having the best of the early part of the season and the Nordschleife Championships. It's across the line, six seconds down, 27, 8-27 on that uh, lap around and that will move them up from 19th position in that BMW. A lot of traffic for Philippe there. He was, I think, he was on the headlight flasher more than he was <laughs> off it uh, there. And uh, yeah, could just couldn't. I mean, to be six seconds off the very fastest time with that amount of traffic clearly shows you that the uh, number one car, the defending champions for Rover Oil, there uh, had nothing wrong with their speed. 
I do think it's interesting, and your reaction and comments on this, that we see the four-hour Nürburgring length Strecker races and indeed the six-hour pre-event to this over the months leading up to the Total ADAC Nürburgring 24 hours. And we look at that and we've seen how well Porsche have done. And, and yet when it comes to this race, Bruce, it really is pretty much a clean sheet. I know there's been balance of performance. I know it's all been looked at. Porsche put their cards on the table early and weren't frightened to do that. As we come here, it's BMW, Porsche, Ferrari, Porsche, BMW, then three more Porsches, Mercedes, Audi, Lamborghini in the top dozen, Ferrari again. And what we're talking about here, yes, we're already into the teams, but we're talking about three, four seconds in a lap that's eight and a half minutes long. This is nothing. This is nothing here at all, is it? No, it, it, entirely. It is, it is super, super close, as we'd expect. Yet, yeah, have people held their class, cars close to their chest? I'm never quite sure. I always feel that's more the more you see that than than here. But um, this is the early jousting. We've got the, the top 30 shootout tomorrow evening. That is when we really start to see the true picture. This session is, yeah, set a decent time, but it's more about bedding in the brakes, getting the drivers all through their runs. And uh, though we've had Philippe Eng and fellow BMW racer Augusto Farfus uh, flashing their lights like mad, you know, they just want to put one decent lap in, but the rest of this, this session, the three hours, is just about settling everything down, getting those laps on the board. But tomorrow, in the top 30 shootout, oh, it's no hold barred. I cannot wait. And they will be going out one at a time. GT tyres, BMW with right rear suspension damage. Now, the good news, if there can be good news, when you've got damage is that that car is still on the Grand Prix circuit. So should be able to limp back and take the back way into the pit lane, which is still available at this stage of the evening. Proper dark now, isn't it? As what are we looking at? Uh, half past 10, 25 minutes to 11 local time. The lights in the paddock and on the front straight, just giving a little bit of assistance to the drivers on the BMW grandstands and the Mercedes Arena grandstands on driver's left as you head across the start-finish line. Out on the track, the BMW i30 NTCR from Hyundai Motorsport. Jean-Carl Vernet, one of the big-name drivers in the 831 on the Dottiger Hall, just goes under the lit Audi uh, I was going to say bridge, but it's, a, it's an Audi sign, isn't it, over the top at the start of the Dottiger Hall. Not noticed that being illuminated before, not self-illuminated at least. Um, I'll stand to be corrected on that. Car at Max Revs coming towards what is a bridge, the Bilstein Bridge. Welcome home, it says, on the driver's side of that this year. You basically just look through the corner there and barely move your hands on the steering wheel. Oh my goodness, how late this Jean-Carl Vernet braked at the end of the lap, takes the big curb on the right-hand side at the final chicane. Back onto the start-finish line with all the cones on the right-hand side and down to finish a lap in the number 831. Uh, that car at the moment, and I'll find the right mouse. Uh, it is ladies and gentlemen. Yes, thank you. It's Bruce. a Hyundai 1 2, the, one, uh, the i30N we've seen with Verne fastest, the Elantra N with Manuel Lauk, German racer, second fastest. In fact, Lauk has just entered the pit lane. A lot of cars in the pits at the moment. Hyundai take this very seriously, this race. Uh, when they launched the fastback version uh, of the i30 um, as a road car, it was sitting in a what looked like a, a big display box. No, no, it was a big display box, but it, it looked like somebody had bought a model car and it was just a little bit closer to you than you thought. It's a magnificent piece of, of marketing. And they've really used this race to good effect to, one, develop their, or this circuit, to develop their end-branded cars, which is 
their sportier versions. And in, in fact, they've got a, a new sporty version of their SUV crossover coming into the UK about now, actually. I'm, I'm going to have a go of one of those and see what it's like. It's an interesting concept. How will it stack up against things like the Alfa Stelvio and the Porsche Macan, which are generally thought to be the best in their class for that type of vehicle. Well, the end corner is on its way and we'll give that a go. But those little two litre four cylinders pushing out the sharp end of 300 horsepower in road trim, World Rally Championship, TCR, and here at the Nürburgring, Hyundai taking this very seriously indeed. Dennis Olsen's behind the wheel of Frickadelli number 31 at the moment. They are screaming past some of the other classes as they head up through Schwalbenschwanz and to the top of the hill before dropping down into the foxhole. So quick through here. Got to be brave if you start taking anything other than the very edges of the curbs. Uh, got a BMW ahead of him and he's on the flasher as well. Dennis, that is, as they head up. Now, as you slow down towards the end, it's down a gear, down a gear, and you can take some of the curbs in Adenauer Force. And again, on the flashes. The BMW, Peter, has got a real strobe effect on their headlights. And the, the refresh rate on that probably means that their driver doesn't lose visibility. I understand that, but I can't believe that is off-putting for the cars they've come up against. Oh, it certainly will be off-putting. I really hope that. Um, we, we talk all the time about transfer from race to road. I really hope that doesn't make it onto the road cars, that's for sure. Um, but I think that's maybe a Nürburgring special. Um, yeah, that, that's got to be a... I mean, you, you hear of the GT drivers at Le Mans complaining about the prototypes and their black pool illuminations on wheels. But, yeah, it's, it just shows you that you, if you want to compete here at the Nürburgring, that's just something you, you've got to put up with because I don't think any of these drivers are going to, you know, they're going to stop anytime soon. I mean, Dennis Olsen also flashing the lights of the Frickadelli Porsche a lot, but absolutely extraordinary. The pace of these SP9 cars and carving through the traffic with just such precision it's it's extraordinary um, to witness and even just to listen to the on board of this screaming flat six in the back of this Frickadelli car. Is there a better sound in the world than a flat six Porsche motor the GTE the GT Le Mans cars squeezed out to just a tad under 4.2 but there's no further for that engine to go these cars sitting at uh, four litres of course and I've, trust me I've seen the gap between the liners in the 4.2 it's not another millimetre it's, it's something like 4.189 in the GTE the GT Le Mans cars and that's it talking to the Porsche engine guys there literally is no further to go Philip Eggs back out again in last year's winning BMW Potentially not exactly the same car, of course, but it carries the number one. Heading down towards the first corner now and the Mercedes Arena. Diving past one of the Cup Class Porsches there. As it goes into the shorter version of turns one and two that don't use the full right and then sweeping through the two left-handers. Because that's being used as paddock area for some of the support races. And we have got, again, the wonderful young timer race, three hours on Friday. Now, we're not covering that, um, but we're going to be watching it. It is available on the event website and YouTube pages with uh, Patrick Simon and our German colleagues looking after that. Absolutely worth a watch on that. Absolutely. It's one of the things that I make sure I'm trackside for every time we come to the Nürburgring. Uh, time's still improving down through the, uh, the timing screen, Bruce. There's still some greens coming in last time around. So the old thing of drivers, and uh, they've told me this before, and I find this a bit scary, but uh, Philippe Eng improved last time before he pitted. Oh, I find it easy when it's dark. There are less distractions. All I can see is the track. That, I mean, I like the logic of it, but my goodness me, 
you've got to have confidence in yourself and your car to go the quickest of the weekend in the darkness hours. It's a little sort of bomb mo that they hang on to. They, if they believe it, that's fine. But <laughs> again, they are rather different specimens to, I'm afraid, uh, those of us who commentate about it. But uh, I sort of get it when you've got that half light or three quarter, no, quarter light, it's going down from half light. It is tricky, but when it's full, fully dark, it's easier again. But, of course, don't forget, when you're in low light and you're not in a part of the circuit that's looking west, when the sun is, well, when the light is fading, the yeah. real pockets of darkness. Of course, we've got the bright bomb blast when we come down the start finish straight, but some of the twisting sections out after ex Muller, again after Cross Tal, it's so, so dark that it is actually better when you've got full darkness and your lights are really bouncing back, almost off the dark, as you will. Uh, hello to uh, William McDonald, who Maurice is teaching the European way of endurance racing. Uh, he's uh, an American in, in Germany at the moment, uh, described by Maurice as in shock but loving it. Yes, excellent stuff. Um, there is that element of the Nürburgring Nordschleifer. Uh, I know I've told this story before, but it's worth seeing again. Uh, years ago, when I first went over. Um, or when I was over doing some IMSA races and we were talking about tracks and somebody said, if you could only race one track ever, where would it be? And I said, the Nürburgring Nordschleife, I don't think there's a, a perfect lap out there. And they said, yeah, no, but I, 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 I mean a real track, not a, not a one on a video game. No, no but the Nürburgring is a real track. <laughs> it can't possibly be. And I had to explain to this person, I'm sure they were not alone in thinking, that it was actually real and not some product of a tortured imagination of a programmer. Then again, I had the same conversation about Colin McRae Rally um, with somebody when somebody was talking about Colin McRae Rally as a uh, as a video game, and this actually speaks to how much motorsport owes to console uh, gaming and and gaming generally. When somebody was talking about Colin McRae Rally and joined, I said, "Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, you know." I've, I've interviewed Colin many times, uh, Wales Rally GB and blah, blah, blah. What, you mean Colin McRae is a real person? Yes, yes, honestly, he is. Drove like a superhero. Well, yeah, well I was going to say, in, in the flesh, you looked in uh, real life videos and they didn't look real at all. No, they didn't. They Everything was so outrageous. Speeded up, absolutely. Uh, but that speech, Peter, doesn't it, to particularly in the last, what, dozen, 15 years maybe, of how risks like the Nürburgring, how various parts of, of motorsport have, have been reaching a new audience, a different audience, via eSports. Um, I think the Sports Car GT, which was the first, oh, hello, uh, which was the first uh, um, sim type of, of endurance racing that I did. Um, and that was before it was called in sports. But what's happened in the last 10, 15 years, and particularly over the last two years, three years, um, has been extraordinary in terms of how that side of motorsport, and I say motorsport because it is real racing. Yeah. Tracks aren't real. The cars may not be real, but the, the racing and the talent and the, the dedication is, it's been extraordinary, hasn't it? It, it certainly has, and I think we are immensely lucky that in the most every entertainment and sporting industry took an enormous unprecedented hit uh, at the beginning of last year when the pandemic kicked off and we've been really racing is actually the only sport that can be so closely to the world you know if you're playing fifa football you're moving your thumbs around now last time i checked you're not allowed to use your thumbs in football um and uh, even if it's like moto gp game Example again, you have to use handhelds. Yeah, so, but with sim racing, you've got a wheel, you've got pedals, you change gear with the paddles if you want, or you can even have a leaf. And also, the software in the there is just mind blowing that you can have something like that in your own home over the world. And it's it's amazing how it brings a, a racing community. It's it's a new level of club motorsport, I find. It's all about accessibility and participation is at the root of it. And, and does it matter, Peter, in your mind, 
whether people transfer it. I mean, there, there have been plenty of things, and we were in right at the beginning of, of GT Academy. Darren Cox's extraordinary program with Nissan and uh, uh, Gran Turismo, um, right at the beginning to bring people from armchair to arnage, as, as was the phrase that we <laughs> coined uh, on, on that one. But does it matter if they don't then go on to race? Because it, it's a, it surely is all about more knowledge, more appreciation, more interest in full metal racing, as much as it is getting people to go and do track days or or get their race licenses. Well, that that's a that's a, a very interesting debate actually, because I've spoken to a number of the top sim racers, which I can tell you put enormous amount of time into their. Pre- you're talking eight, nine, ten hours a day. And if you're not putting that in, you're nowhere. Uh, yeah. And so it's a day behind the screen all day, every day. Um, however, the, having spoken to a couple of the really top sim racers who race in the Porsche Tag Heuer eSports Super example, there, there's a 200,000 um, prize pot. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of drivers who I was thinking to one particular who I won't name, who was saying, you know, I can I can put in the same amount of time and I can rate for prize money and do it professionally, or I can empty my savings account on one season of Fair very point. entry level motorsport. Yeah, and it's impossible to to argue with that. I think where it comes in it, to to your point about the person who thought Nurburgring was a, a fictional circuit. I mean, if you went or you landed from an alien planet and went around it, you wouldn't believe that it was that it was real. Um, So I think if it gives people an appreciation and an understanding, I think at the very, very, very top level, I think the the absolute experts will stay within the virtual world. I I firmly believe that um, for a variety of reasons. But I think uh, in the layer, you've now got nearly 200,000 members on iRacing, for example. Yeah. Now, you don't need to get an enormous percentage of them. And all of a sudden, you've got a, a whole new... Uh, level of fan base. And, and people like Bruce that we've talked about the NLS of the uh, Sam Drogan. He's been in the NLS. He, he's, he's Now I know he did some real world motorsport before he concentrated uh, on esports but he has since come back in the real world and raced in NLS. Augustin Kino who's outstanding in the virtual world. Uh, he's done a variety of full metal racing. So there is uh, uh, both ways. You know, Spengler and Philip Eng, uh, BMW drivers, take esports very seriously. Well, they did. In fact, uh, the BMW uh, PR program got right behind it and treated it when there wasn't full metal racing happening like the real thing. They handed it in exactly the same way. Of course, you've got the class of drivers who, uh, the type of drivers like Sammy Matty Trogan, already on the books with some of the Formula One teams for their sim work. But it was also engineers crossing over the other way, crossing yeah. into sim racing to keep themselves sharp. And you know what? They, a lot of the, them who did that found they were really surprised, not just how similar it was, but how they still learn and stretch their capabilities at a time when there was no racing happening out. Uh, on the circuits themselves. So it, it it really surprised me, not that it grew, but just by the ability. And um, and that was about a year ago, and it's right. moved on leaps and bounds since since then, John. Dries van to follow, think, the Huber Motorsport number 23 Porsche down through the top of the foxhole, and uh, that car getting out of shape and on the kerb, Dries keeping his foot in, and going through actually Lawrence actually uh, excuse me took was the, it yeah took the drive uh, obviously Tristan Vidas had it start with and then uh, Lawrence slotted in because the one thing he doesn't want his brother to do is win the race he wants to win it so uh, Lawrence has won here before but you know a little bit of inter sign rivalry always just adds to the spice now John you were talking about how people really do need to go through their checklist of races they have to attend in their lives and uh, I think you could be fairly safe that the number in 24 hours should be on that list. But we'll be around for years to come. But I remember being told uh, back in the early 90s, this is the final year. This was one of many final years for the Rouen Les Isars circuit. And oh, I yeah. decided to go over for the weekend and try and catch it at the last asking. Of course, I did that in about 1992. What a circuit. Yep. Dropping downhill. I always remember a fantastic shot of Fangio 
sideways in his Mercedes at the Virage de Cisfer on the way down the slope. By the time I got there, it had a chicane instead of that wonderful, uh, fearsome right-hander with this enormous earth bank sort of right in front of the driver's faces as they went into that turn. And then, of course, I came back and I think the circuit ran for at least another six years in, in some form or other. But you do need to have a wish list. You do need to start Absolutely. picking them off. Agreed. And, and actually, that track, you can still walk round most of that circuit. Not all of it. Some of it's been lost to the new dual carriageway at Rouen Les Arts. But they, they did, bizarrely, uh, they knocked down the, the old tribunes and the pit lane complex quite a few years ago now. And then, bizarrely, out of nowhere, they tarmacked over the Nouvelle Monde hairpin, which was the cobbled hairpin at the bottom of the hill. Um, but, bizarrely, because the, all the heavy lorries with close coupled trailers were using that as a wee cut through, rather than going down to the roundabout um, outside of Les Césars, which is right at the bottom of the hill. Great Chinese restaurant they used to be down there as well, by the way. We used to stop down the way to and from the mud. But because the lorries were, were doing that with a close couple of rear wheels on the trailers, it took all the time out up and brought, and brought the cobbles back up again. Worth a go to go down and see that, particularly if you're heading down to Le Mans, just on the south side of Rouen, um, past the, the burned out church. Look at it, find it. Uh, the big TV mast is a good place to aim for. Find out what you can about that and then drive around it slowly. And as you're coming back up the far side, stop, walk into the forest. There's, there was about three or four different iterations of that track. The cutout in the middle of the forest is still there. Some of the old stuff you can still walk that has the gravel traps around the outside of it. It's part of still a country walk that's there. Park up your car, do it, and imagine what was going on in European Formula 2 until what Bruce and I would still think was relatively recent. I've, I've got a piece of the old pit lane complex there from when um, Jeremy Shaw, Martin, Haven, myself, Eve, and a couple of others we're going down there and Jeremy traipsed off in the trees and went, this is where I camped me, put my tent up between these two trees in 19, whatever it was. And some of the old concrete was still there. So I picked up a big lump of concrete, which was painted in gulf blue, still had the reinforcement behind it and brought that home. Great place to be. When were they, how, how late were they still racing at Ruin Les Arts, Arts, uh, Bruce? Well, I think through to the Formula, the Formula 3, raced there until 1993. I went there in 91 or 92. Um, but the thing that really got me was A, that they were still racing on it, and B, gradient is the thing you don't understand yes. at until you go there. And when you rise up, Virage du, the Nou Nouveau Mont hairpin is at the very bottom of the hill. But as you come back up, there's a, a right kink, a left kink, and then there's a tight left. And if you go straight on, you can fall down a ravine. And I think it was Brian Redmond did that at Virage Saint-Saëns. And I knew about that, and I got there, I went, oh, it really is a ravine. It's, yes. it's astonishing. Through the trees, down the bank. Um, and I'm fairly sure it was Redmond, but, I mean, it was a circuit that famously used to bite very, very hard indeed. Yeah, and, and coming up the hill from Nouvelle Monde, I, I remember going up through the S's there, and you can see the trees on the right-hand side, and, you know, they're very, very mature trees. Yeah, but you're only seeing the top 15% of those trees. The rest of them yeah. are way down, way down in that ravine. Yeah, you spot on. And I, keep, I sort of think of that about the TT, which comes around at absolutely the wrong time normally um, for us because we're always being busy with, with the Le Mans 24 hours. And as a big motorcycle fan, it's one of the things I want to do. I've got some good friends from Greenlight TV in the Isle of Man, on the Isle of Man, and I've been to the Isle of Man a few times and I love it. I really love to go there for the TT and I've never managed to do it and I would really love to do that. And there's a couple of other things that still are on the, the wish list, but we've been very fortunate in what we've done down the years to be able to tick off quite a few of these things. Bathurst was my one of my favourites, which I did seven or eight years ago now, which I should have done 15 years before then. I had a distant relative who built engines. Woody's class actually, Bruce hanged off in late 60s in a Toyota 1000, believe it or not, when it was still a multi-class race. Then built the engines um, for Pete Brock, the hanged off Gowan engines in the um, back in the Tirana days for, for Peter Brock when he was having one of his famous fallout with the factory and the, the yellow car won there. 
uh, marvellous. Uh, Bruno recently, went to Bruno, what, a couple of years ago now. That was one of my latter circuits that was the first time at. Uh, went round the old track there, the old long circuit there. That certainly worth, worth a look. There's a lot of good books, Bruce, about lost circuits. Give me a chance to plug one of yours. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm turning around, having a little look at the shelf. But yes, loads and loads. And there are some books specifically about lost circuits, but um, read them. And wherever you're going, if you're if you're making a trek yeah, yeah. to a contemporary circuit, try and see if there's one you can pick off. And I'll tell you, Trevor Oh, the, the drive from um, Sydney up to Bathurst, if you stop in the Blue Mountains, I went on Catalina Risk. Not knowing. Cat was it Catalina? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I literally went to a bookshop about two blocks away no from way. there, and I only discovered it when I got back. I thought, oh, I thought that was somewhere further away, kicking myself. Oh, I've walked, walked around the whole track. That's an awfully tricky circuit. I've horror. walked. Horror. Oh, I've walked around the whole circuit there, uh, and it is a beautiful um, decline. Um, yeah. Uh, such Katoomba. A it's a Katoomba, isn't it? Yeah. Catalina Park. Uh, oh, man. And when you think what was racing around there, the equivalent of Formula 5000, oh. um, then it was, it, was, it was restored. Go and look on um, your favourite video site. Rallycross. They had a Rallycross circuit there relatively recently, in kind of speak, kind of in Bruce speak. Um, go and have a look at Catalina Park Raceway, Katoomba, New South Wales. Find it if you're driving up um, there's two ways that you can go up from Sydney to uh, to Bathurst. Uh, one is to go the old um, Bell of Line Road, uh, Bell's Line of Road, uh, and the other one is to go up past Katoomba. And uh, do both, because both of them are worth doing, uh, but you must go to Katoomba and have a, have a scooch around Catalina Park. Couldn't get the car on it. Uh, it's all closed up, but you can still walk around it. And it, it's still got some of the old signage, all the old railway sleepers marking the edge of the track. There's a bit of old rusty arm core, a bit of subsidence, the far side of the track. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. Then when you go back and watch the old video of it, it puts it all in perspective. Love that sort of stuff. Love it. Uh, what we got left? Oh, we're inside the last half an hour. Doesn't time fly when you're enjoying yourself? See, Peter, this is what you've let yourself in for coming to be part of this crew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it. I've uh, one uh, old, very old circuit that intrigues me is Avis. Oh. Uh, that was just out, just on the edge. There's a lot of urban myths around Avis. It was just on the edge of the east-west border uh, in Berlin. And they actually raced, in fact, Dario Franchitti raced there in DTM, DTM. in the mid-90s. But it was obviously quite a different circuit then than what it was in period when Richard von Frankenberg went through what was an extraordinary banked uh, oval there and it was yeah amazing crowds used to come to Avis because of course it was a way uh, a good place for for those in from the east to, to come and watch some some motorsports yeah huge amounts of of, uh, of attention which is which was great but uh, we, we've got a, a, a particular um, a prankster and Rolex 24 hour, multiple Rolex 24 hour winner watching us tonight, John, and uh, Jordan Taylor making his usual comments about drivers and their headlight flashes. Excellent. Uh, JT, <laughs> all <laughs> good. Uh, doing great work as ever, Jordan, and part of a racing dynasty in the United States. I am absolutely certain that this will be, this race will be on his wish list. Uh, and by the way, we were talking about Sammy Matty Trogan, the Scandinavian driver. He is here this weekend, Peter, isn't he? Yes, he's in the number 102 Walkenhorst car, which has my favourite sponsor, uh, or very helpful sponsor to me. Uh, it's Alpacin Anti-Balding Shampoo is all over that car. Not, not the shampoo itself, they're branded. Uh, and that's the car that Sammy Matty's in. German engineering, where you that's need it. it. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. For your hair. Uh, very good. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that one or two car. It's the uh, the M6, isn't it? The Valken Holst mm. car. Dries, Van Terst, still behind the wheel of the number 15 Audi. 
out in the full darkness now. Dropping down to uh, Brunchen. And then climbing up from the exit of Brunchen using a little bit of the block paving on the left-hand side through the ice curve. Very bright headlights nowadays, of course, on the cars. He's set quite low, actually. The road in front of him, perfectly illuminated. I think at the speeds there we're going, I would quite like something a bit further in the distance, but where the trees are close, you do get the advantage of that tunnel effect. And that does help. When it opens up a wee bit, then it is a bit different. There's one or two wee patches of, uh, of fog as well as the temperature inversion kicks in at this stage in the evening. In, in behind the GT tyres, GT4 Audi. That's the number 53 car that has just gone through on the entrance to the Kleiner carousel. Now, make sure he hits the... Uh, sorry, that was the... Yes, that was the Kleiner carousel. Make sure he hits the, makes, hits the final third apex of the... Gallows Hill corner onto the Dottinger Hall. And Bruce, news of a change at the sharp end of the field. New best placed Audi is now up into fourth place. Michele Beretta, Phoenix Racing, uh, R8 LMS. One minute, sorry, one minute, that'd be a bit fanciful. Eight minutes, 21.8 seconds. That puts him 0.775 of a second down on the 77. Uh, BMW Junior Team M6, which is still top of the charts, but we've got five cars covered by the top second. And John, you always talk about how, you know, half a second on a regular circuit's a bit of a gap here, but a second around a 20, nearly 26 kilometer circuit really is nothing. We've got five cars, we've got the number within that bracket of time, and others starting to chip away as well. Suddenly, an improvement from the other car from the Phoenix Audi scene, the number 15 entry, but that only goes up to 12th place. But really, that is a great lap uh, from Michele Beretta. Saw him smiling and looking very relaxed in the pits about half an hour ago, maybe slightly longer. It moves very quickly indeed, but uh, certainly out on the track doing a great job there. Michele Beretta, fourth fastest. Uh, over 20 classes in this race. We haven't talked about the leaders in the other class. We've been so transfixed by what's going on at the front of the field where Klaus Backler leads for Portland Motorsport in SP9. It is the Glickenhaus that leads in SPX. They're 24. Felipe Fernandez lays uh, with the time for that car. It is the True Racing KTM Crossbow in 32nd that leads the Cup X class. Uh, that is the number 114 machine. 350 in 35th position leads SP Pro. The Black Falcon Team Heat Deck, Porsche, GT3 Cup MR. Chris Meese has just come into the pits in the SP7 leader. That's the GT3 Porsche Cup car, number 80 of Huber Motorsport. Black Falcon, Mercedes MG GT4 in the SP8 T category in 44th position for the 36 car, leads their class. AT, this is the alternatively fueled car, and this is the four. Uh, four Motors by your concept machine, Porsche 911 GT3 Cup. And uh, that leads the alternative field. And Schmudo, the pop star, rock star, that uh, is on that. Saw him do his gig at the Hockenheim ring when we were there for DTM doing some work a few years ago. That's in 47th position. And Klaus Backler, top of the shop uh, in... The 33, by the way, for Falkland Motorsports in the 911 GT3 R. Let's go through the rest of the class leaders. SP10, Schnitzelarm Racing, GmbH, BMW, BMW, Mercedes AMG GT4. The, the 34 car leads that SP10 class in 48th. 49th is TCR leader. That's the Hyundai i30N, the 831 car. That's in the pits. GTEC Competition. Lead Cup 3 in one of the myriad of Porsche Caymans in a variety of classes. So 305 in 54th position. 63 leads Cup 5. That's the Cup 5 is the new BMW M2 Club Sport racing cars. Um, 
the older cars, what are now the 240s, used to be the 235s, they've got their own category. We'll come to them in a moment. So it's Schubert Motorsport in the 890 that leads that Cup 5 uh, in 63rd position. That's the 890 car. 67th is the number 10. That leads SP3T, the Max Kreuzer Racing VW Golf GTI TCR. Uh, the GT Tire Motorsport Audi 53. Uh, the car that we were just talking about, that's in 71st and leading SP8. The SP14 leader is the 86 Porsche Cayman GTS in 79th. Adrenaline Motorsports have a Porsche Cayman S981 uh, leading V6. That's the 131 car in 80th position. 83rd is V3T leader. That's the 168 Team Mapple Racing Porsche 718 Cayman S. 320 BMW G20 is leading V2T for Adrenaline Motorsport, another Adrenaline car, the 330. Uh, on the side of that, that's the number of that car. That's an 88. Volta Strychek leading for the Foxtail Manta, the 125 in 95th position in that uh, very, uh, what was it, Peter, you called it earlier on, uh, Dolly Mixture. Uh, I was going to call it Licorice also, we were both thinking of confectionery <laughs> there, but it is Volker who leads that uh, in 95th position. The BMW 240i class is led by, guess what, a BMW M240i from Adrenaline Motorsport, and uh, that's the 231 car in 96th position. It's another Adrenaline Motorsport team, Porsche Cayman, that leads the V5 class, that's the 141 in 101st position. The Hoffa Racing BMW, which had a couple of spins earlier on today, is in the pits, but still leading SP6 in their M3 CSL in 107th position. Right behind them on the timing screens in V4, the leader there is a venerable E90 BMW 325 straight six. Great motor uh, in the 151 car. That's in 108th position. 111th position is SP4, another straight six BMW. This is an E90 325 in SP4 for the 325 numbered car and Hyundai Motorsport i20N is leading SP2T and that is the final of our class leaders the 165 machine in the pits in 113th position Phew, we. Uh, we won't be doing the full rundown of all the classes every hour during the race we'll split them up so it doesn't take me quite as long as that to go through them all uh, something must have happened whilst I was talking about that and I still reckon, Bruce, we've already seen 122 cars doing a lap this evening, or at least today, should I say. The Dacia yeah, Logan that... has done some extra laps this evening. It did do a full lap this morning. Yeah, no, you're correct. I was waiting to see if we got up to the 125 cars. I had my entry list at the start of the day. Those final three would pop out. They have yet to do so. You alluded to the fact that things keep on changing new name at the top of the charts. Falcon Motorsports, Klaus Backel have just banged in at 8 minutes 20.237. Uh, second lap, so fastest by 8 tenths of a second for the BMW Junior Team M6 at the moment. But will there be improvements around the final lap? I'm not seeing many pink or green timing sectors, so perhaps not. But uh, for Klaus Backler, of course, we heard from him uh, before the show. And he's not just driving the 33 Porsche for Falcon Motorsports, but the 44 as well. He's he's greedy for success here. That is, frankly, that is just greedy. There's no need for that as well. Uh, thanks to Alan Prosser, uh, screen grab that appears to be showing a uh, Toyota Gazoo Racing Altis back out on the circuit, being passed by Falcon Motorsports' Klaus Backler not so very long ago. So keep an eye open for that Team Thailand car with Nat Davoudi, Turan Sukumatana as listed as part of the driving talent in there. Oh, how much fun um, we had with all of the Thai names when we were doing Race of Champions uh, out in the National Stadium, the Ram Ramanganjala Stadium a few years ago. Usual chaos in the pit lane, uh, swinging cars around into their sort of what, not quite 45 degrees, but certainly at a jaunty angle at the sort of echelon angle, the BWT 
Mercedes of Maxi Gutz is in. That is the uh, number seven car, which is entered by Get Speed. Been so used down the years, Bruce, to seeing those in the, the bright red Vodafone colours. Things move on, John. We have to try and catch up, but that's a car. That, look, at, look at that driving crew. Maxi Gutz, Danny Juncadea, Raffaele Marcello and Fabian Schiller. That has to be, if the Mercedes can... Uh, Rise the task, be a car very much heading for the top three in this race. But so far, Mercedes has been the mark among the German gang that has not been really at the sharp end of the field. It's been Porsche, BMW and Audi. So you can imagine there is a huge pressure down at Mercedes. In fact, the best place Mercedes at the moment is in 13th place. And it's not the one we were talking about, but number six, one of the two cars from the HRT team the Hout Racing Team. And in fact, that was the car that was fastest in first qualifying yeah. today. But uh, it slid away from them a little. And extraordinarily in that team of many talents, Peter, that the, in that number seven car, the Bruce has just read out that. I, I mean, it's a, almost a who's who of endurance racing. But yet to take test success here. Uh, I had to say, it took me, I had to double and triple and quadruple check my notes uh, when putting that. Maximilian Goats, Daniel Juncadella, Raffaele Marciello and Fabian Schiller, none of them in that number seven get speed Mercedes have won the Nürburgring 24 hour. Of course, Raffaele Marciello crashed out of the lead in the horrible rain not long before the race was actually stopped. Uh, and you remember the images of Raphael with his helmet visor open and just with his head in his hands. And I remember watching Raphael make Lawrence Vantor and El Bamber looked pretty ordinary at Macau a couple of years ago and that's something you never see um, but it just shows you how this, this race, uh, she chooses who she wants to take the silver silverware That's often said about races that provide a particular challenge uh, Bathurst uh, Pikes Peak in National Hill Climb here at the Nürburgring Le Mans to a, a certain extent as well, down through the years, Bruce, we've seen all kinds of manufacturers throw cubic currency denominations at Le Mans and being stymied by uh, a small, sharp piece of gravel left on the track by a fairly innocuous off by somebody else hours earlier or a, a literally a, a, a 50 cent item that's gone wrong on the cars. And, and that, I think, is one of the, the great in some ways for us as as spectators and enthusiasts I'm sure not for the, the car companies but that is is one of the great joys of endurance racing that it's very difficult to buy yourself a victory either in financial terms or technology terms there's an element of luck that still has to go along with you getting to the sharp end of the field Bob Wallach mm. is all I can say he oh did everything God. far win the more and you know and many, many times over. You just have to accept there is that hard to quantify, impossible to quantify element that, that is out there. And uh, again, just looking at that number seven crew, the fact that Maxi Gertz hasn't won this race, he's been a top level GT racer in Germany for a very long time, but it hasn't come his way as yet. Could it be this time around? But I just haven't seen the pace from Mercedes this year on the Nordschleife. But maybe it's not so good over the curbs, over the bumps. Wow. And the, the rival manufacturers are better at riding it because this is not Monza. This is not a circuit like Paul Ricard where the curbs are flat and uh, you, you can use them without, uh, you know, effects. Here there is cause and effect and going up and coming down, certainly it doesn't seem to suit the Mercedes. And one of the things about experience here is you need to know the curbs that you can and indeed must use and the ones that you absolutely 100% have to have to avoid. And certainly coming, you know, if you come up the hill from Bergwerk, the curbs look fairly flat in the first part of that rise through the three lefts. You don't really need to use them. And then as you... They're beginning to go through mood curve and, and that sort of area. You kind of feel like you want to use them and you can't use them because they're not a flat curve. They, they look like a curb on a city street. That they're not at 90 degrees to the track, but my goodness, they're not far off. And that's fast through there. It's a lift down a gear and then straight back on 
the throttle and then as you go back up again there's that little wiggle before you get to the, the base of the hill before you turn around and climb right and turn up to the Caracciola carousel and that last curve on the left left hand side oh it's so inviting I'll nail that you nail that you're going to take a wheel off it's really really important that you know your way around here because those are seconds and when you you know we talked about that beat the first of the Mercedes AMGs uh, Bruce being down in 14th position, but they're three and a half seconds off, that's all. The point zero eights, five seconds away from the KCMG Porsche, who are a tenth away from Frickadelli and, and Nick Tandy, who is half a second away from Rover Racing and, and Philip Eng. You know, these are tiny margins, and knowing where you can cheat the curbs and find time and where you can't is so important. A new fastest lap, Peter Mackay right to the top and it's a new manufacturer at the top as well today on this fast thursday oh it's it's lighting up here and there's just 10 minutes on the clock mirko bortolotti has gone fastest in a lamborghini hurricane with hankook tires on that particular car so wow. the timing screen is lighting up it did not seem that long ago it's, in fact it seemed for most of this day that it's been a Mercedes on top, and then all of a sudden, everyone's just pulled the cork out the bottle, lit the lit the touch paper, and fired in all these fastest lap times. So I wonder if we'll maybe see a bit more movement over the last... Of course, there's nine and a half minutes on the clock, but of course, if you get over just across the line in time, you get another lap. So really, in effect, we've maybe got another 15 or 20 minutes, actually, yeah. in fact. Spot on. Spot on, Peter. Peter. Uh, Lamborghini Porsche in second now. Lance David Arnold last time around was his fastest lap at 8.20, but it's all of a sudden it's a second and a half at the front of the field. So Hancock, then Falcon tyres. Uh, Bruce, what do we reckon the uh, BMW Junior team in third uh, are on the 77 cars? That'll be three different tyre manufacturers in the top three, won't it? Uh, I have a double quick. I explained I the, my little Charlie faux pas Charlie earlier where I, I, I saw Falcon on a lot of cars. I thought, gosh, a lot of cars are running on Falcon this year, and then found that was just a, a regular sponsor. Can I just point out, though, John, that it's uh, five seconds improvement since uh, this morning's qualifying That's session point. that B Bortolotti's found, and, and, and it was only a three-and-a-half-second gain until Bortolotti oh. slotted that lap in. So that really was a quantum leap. I Matteo have Caroli, now... sorry, Bruce. Matteo Caroli just up the third in the Grello 911 Manti Racing Porsche 82100. Uh, Still only one car below the 820. Bruce, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just doing a little tyre research, so you're quite right. Hankook fastest on Bortolotti's FFF Racing Team Lamborghini. Second place, it's the Falcon Motorsport Porsche. No clues given there for <laughs> what tyres they're on. And third place, Manti Racing on Michelin. The, the BMW Junior Team I have them down as Michelin as well, but I need to right. double check by double checking if you follow my drift. Yes. They are I, Michelin. Yeah. They are Michelin. Okay. Thank you. Luca Engsler uh, out in the 831 Hyundai i30 NTCR with seven and three quarter minutes to go. And just diving in through the back entrance to the pits and he is coming into the pits and we had in the group of cars that Luca was catching we had all three options taken there the KTM crossbow went around to go back around the start finish line three of the cars including uh, Luca went into the pit lane and one of the cars I'm sorry I didn't really notice who it was went out on to the hats of black so right now there are three options at the end of the Grand Prix circuit onto the Nürburgring stay to the left in the middle, you can go back through the chicane. It's a manufactured chicane with sort of tyre bundles there. Back round where the cones are and onto the start finish street and have another go at the, at the Grand Prix circuit. Or you can stay right and come in through the normal entrance from the Grand Prix track into the pit lane. And we had all three of them used at the same point there. Six and a half minutes to go. Just a, a note on TCR, you, I think the Hyundai team will be very, very happy because, of course, the i30N, which is quickest right now, is well established. But the new Elantra, brand new model, of course, only half a second off the pace. Yeah. I think Hyundai would be delighted with that. 
Yeah, the sort of slightly longer body uh, on that car and the sort of fast back bodywork on it. As we mentioned earlier, London, one of the manufacturers who have used, extensively used the Nürburgring for testing. They've got a performance centre uh, not too far away and they've used this race as well to some effect. Uh, Alan Prosser says, why has nobody ever integrated headlights of sorts into the top of the windscreen? Um, surely drivers would be able to see a lot further unless it's not allowed. I, I think there are regs, and Peter has been trawling the regs, about high, how high, it's, it's a bit like Department of Transport um, construction and use, as we would have said back in my dad's day of, of policing. Um, um, Bradley, although he never did traffic, so he wasn't very good on con and use regs. Um, there are regulations about how high lights can be off the ground. So you can't have Baja style roof lights or um, windscreen height mounted lights. Nowadays, with the. It's a good question, Alan, in fairness. Uh, nowadays, with the advances in lighting technology, and by the way, if you've never run LED lights on your race car and you're racing in the dark, you're in for a treat when you do. I've got some LEDs on the, the mighty BMW K1600 JT, Clearwater as they're called. Martin Short sort of does out and uh, fitted them for me from Roll Centre. And that makes a huge difference on the motorcycle, despite the fact that the BMW's got a gyroscopically controlled um, light that goes round corners and straightens itself up when you lean over and all of that. But I remember racing at Anglesey in the Race of Remembrance in a MG, a V6 MG, which had pretty good headlights actually, twin headlights on that car. We had a light bar on that. And when I remember to turn it on, it was like turning night to day. And so when we got to the court, the 24 hour race for Aston Martin Lagonda in the Vantage GT8, GT4 car and they were they had uh, two wee light bars mounted lower, lower down in the grille underneath the bumper um, but set quite far out so that it spread the light all the way across the ground made a huge huge difference uh, and so the lightning technology Alan I think has, has changed massively down through the years to, to the point actually where I think we've seen at Le Mans down through the years Drivers asking if some of the normal road furniture, the road signs, could be covered over because that is reflective and it's actually quite blinding the amount of light that's coming out of the race cars now, Bruce. And we, we've seen that happen uh, for a few years now at Le Mans when they trailed their laser lights and the LED matrix controlled lights on the on the prototypes down through the years. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been a, a massive, massive step forward. And um, because if ever you look at any onboard footage from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they weren't quite candles behind bits of glass, but uh, my really lab was, yes, it's sort of the equivalent. <laughs> yes, you probably had the same sort of lighting capability when you had a dynamo strapped to the back wheel of your bike that had three speed Sturmley Archer gears. Uh, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, you know how far back I'm going and how rubbish those lights were. <laughs> and of course, as you slowed down, just when you needed to be seen, as you slowed down, they got dimmer. And when you were standing still, you had no lights on at all, front or rear. Whose bright idea was that? So, Burke, Burke a lot, Merkel Bertolotti in the Lamborghini Huracan, still on top of the pile for Hankook Triple F Racing Team. 1.6 seconds the lead now to Falcon, who are back out again. That's David Arnold about halfway around the lap at the moment. Improvement on the last lap around for Kevin Estre. We mentioned that. The Welsh improved uh, before pitting last time around. That was the Octane Ferrari, 11th position for them. 8.22, 8.24 for Manuel Metzger and the Mercedes team's HRT. Number four, that's down 21st position, but still 21st position, Peter, but only six seconds. And in a lap of uh, eight minutes, eight and a half minutes, that's a very small percentage for those guys. 
it is absolutely extraordinary the depth of um, depth of talent and depth of quality of entry that we've got in in SP9. You know, with all the, you know, you've got Lamborghini, Porsche, BMW, Audi, Ferrari. They're all in there, all fighting on a level playing field, and it's just. It's, I think actually in this qualifying session, it's been so close that actually it's it could be more who's getting a clean lap. Uh, that's always a factor at the Nürburgring, of course, but I've got to think that Lamborghini are going to be very, very happy with the way things are, but I still feel we've got a tiny little bit of movement just uh, just yet. I also think the Frickadelli cars, I think they're keeping their... I feel they're keeping an ace up their sleeve, really? of course. One, yeah, I think so. I think they were one two in the qualifying race i think they're keeping it pretty quiet at the moment and uh I, i've got an eye on them for the for the win on sunday afternoon and i tell you what there wouldn't be a dry eye in the place oh, if, uh, absolutely if Riccadelli were to to get their first n24 win if they did uh sabina schmitz uh her, one of her bmw winning cars will be doing some demo laps uh before the full field rolls off about 10 minutes before the full field rolls off at 10 past 3 Central European time so they'll be out about 3 o'clock Alan uh, no not wasn't Alan who was it uh, stand by it was George Jarrett that tweeted uh, us at RSL underscore studio do the slower cars have to use yellow lights or can they use white it used to be gritting the yellows at Le Mans shame they dropped that idea there was a there was a very good reason for the yellow lights at Le Mans uh George, uh, uh, it, it comes from the fact that it used to be the law in France to have yellow lights on on road cars. And because it was on a public road, the road-derived cars had to use yellow-tinted headlamps. And, and it stayed for a wee while, even when that regulation in France disappeared, uh, to make a distinction between GT cars and prototypes so that you could tell if it was yellow lights coming up behind you then it was a GT car if it was white it was a prototype the problem came that the GT cars were getting faster and faster and in all honesty the yellow tinted glass perspex whatever was actually um, not as efficient in terms of lighting the road and albeit Le Mans was getting lighter uh, with more lighting towers around so that 24-hour TV could work, particularly, what, 10, 15 years ago when the US networks were taking uh, full live coverage. But it was thought it would be a good idea then to waive that tradition, as it were. But as far as I know, Peter, and you've been scrolling through the regs, I think everybody can use white lights here in fact I'm, I'm certain they can and there are some regs about how many additional lights you can have and, and led light bars etc but other than that uh, everybody can use uh, led white lights I think I maybe remember reading something about that before falling asleep in my porridge um, <laughs> reading through the technical regulations uh, Yes, it was very, as as always, very specific on what you can run. Of course, you've got to run the mandatory LED light system uh, as well, which signifies, it gives um, information on who's in the car and also where the position in class is as well. I did remember that, but we spent most of my time trying to search through the uh, regulations to get the minimum pit stop times, which I'm sure we'll oh, talk about. Oh, don't even the, go there. Oh, my goodness. That's yeah, an algorithm. So, that is, oh my. That is yeah. applied mathematics level five open university course. Um, somebody with a, a cable knit sweater with uh, leather patches on the sleeve will be along in the wee small hours on Saturday to explain that for us. Daniel M at 42 Ice uh, has found it. It says headlights must be in the original position. Additional lighting allowed must be in the grill or in front of the bodywork. We've seen that before uh, as well, of course. Uh, so, yeah, the Manti car in the pits at the moment has additional LED lights mounted uh, down where the normal fog lights would be in a Porsche 911. Nice to see that uh, some familiar faces are down in the pit lane, including Franz Conrad standing behind his Lamborghini. Franz, what a... 
I mean, what a stalwart of endurance racing. One of the first people to run the Celine S7R when I was involved with that project at RML and won Le Mans, uh, won, Le Mans won Sebring 12 hours, first time out against the might of the Corvettes. That was a big turnaround. So that's about it then for Thursday. And we have a new top time to talk about, and that goes to the Lamborghini Huracan, not from the Conrad team, but from the Hankook Tyres Triple F Racing Team, and 818.575. All of the sessions counting, of course, as qualifying sessions. It is Fulton Motorsports in second with the 33 car. They're 44 down in ninth position. Uh, it's another Porsche in third for the number 911 for Manti Racing, very much the local team. Um, have been known to drive their cars on the public road from Moist Path to the paddock here at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. But the rest of the top 10, 77 BMW in fourth position, Rootronic and Porsche number three in fifth, Audi Sport Team car collection number two in sixth, seventh, the Ferrari from Wachtspiegel, Team Manta with the uh, WTM powered by Phoenix, Ferrari number 22. Phoenix Racing in eighth with the 11 Audi. Then the 44, as I mentioned, from Falcon and the Porsche. BMW from Valkenhorst in 10th uh, position in the 101. That's your top 10. And a fairly clear run today. Uh, just check through, by the way, the Toyota Altus wasn't back out. That was one of the other Toyotas that was back out on the circuit. But Bruce Jones, uh, precious little incident in terms of contact, either with other cars or certainly with the barriers. I'm, I'm sure there have been some technical issues. We've seen one or two cars grind to a halt. But in terms of panel beating overnight, um, very little work to do, to be honest, before Friday. Unbelievably clean and wonderfully clean. But you know what? The more the drivers come and compete in the rounds of the Nürburgring Langstrecken Series or the VLN as it used to be.